news or um, announcements before we start. Everyone has an evaluation, and Mark has asked that you take the time to fill it out because this is how we continue to improve the conference. And he's even going to give free chicken soup cookbook. So you can turn these in on Sunday evening, and just in case you're interested, the Master of Ceremonies is on the second page, and I am sending a son to college. So all five would be greatly appreciated. As far as the new badges, it is? Can you hear me? All right. As far as new badges or corrections that were requested, they're going to be ready at 10 o'clock at the break, so feel free to pick those up. Lunch is at noon, and we're going to have the unstoppable Robert Allen, who will be speaking about 1240. So make sure you get in there and um, be ready, because he's going to start around 1240. Okay, let's see here. I think it's time to introduce Mark. Mark, come on down here. Now, I, let's, give Mark a, let's give him some positive energy and love as he's walking down the aisle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, you need to sit here. Oh, you're right behind the plants. They can't see you. Okay. There we go. Now, we got a lot of information about Mark yesterday, right? We all know he is amazing. So I thought what we would do is get some inside information from those who really know Mark Victor Hansen. Is anybody interested in some inside information? Okay. So first, <laughs> you can't run away here. First off, I talked to Jack. We all know Jack Canfield, who is his partner with Chicken Soup for the Soul. And this is what Jack said about Mark Victor Hansen. Mark is someone who really cares to make a difference in the world and wants to go about it in a big way and does. That's why I play with him. Now, wasn't that nice? Jack went on to say... <laughs> <laughs> We've written numerous books together. Our families have vacationed together. And in the early days, we even shared hotel rooms together. Too much information, right? <laughs> to keep our expenses down. And yet this man has never forgotten the time that I borrowed and accidentally broke his boogie board. <laughs> Each time we finish a tour, I know it's true, each time we finish a tour, he'll say, that was great, but what about my boogie board? <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we were in New York to launch Chicken Soup for the American Soul. It was an amazing event, and all Mark could think about is his boogie board. Over and over, he won't let me forget the boogie board. So today, I'm going to put an end to this, and Mark, here is your boogie board. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but wait, there's more. There's more, yes. Okay, Bob Proctor, who is a dear friend of ours. Who knows Bob? Love Bob. Let's give Bob a hand. We love him. This is what he said about Mark Victor Hansen. He said, you'd have to get up real early in the morning to outgive Mark. Is that the truth? That is the truth. And so I have an alarm clock set here at 3 o'clock in the morning for anyone who really wants to get a head start on this. Anybody interested? I'm not giving this away. It's my alarm clock anyway. But I thought it was kind of a cute prop, okay? <laughs> I love that alarm clock. Okay, Robert Allen, who, of course, is another longtime friend. How many friends do you have, Mark? Three. You've got a lot. We've got four. I'm a friend. Anyway, this is... Three. I'm one of the three. Thank you. Uh, he said that Mark Victor Hansen is the Einstein of the heart. Is that nice? That's really nice. But, you know, enough about Einstein and his theory of relativity. This is what's relative to our event today, and it's E equals MVH square. Do you love that? Here you go. Hey, work with me, okay? All right. Now, this is a good one. This is from his dear wife, Patty. Now, they've been married 23 years. And this is what she said. Mark, are you nervous? 
<laughs> it gets better. Living with you for the last 23 years has been a whirlwind of activity. Dear, you keep my life interesting. And I never know if you're coming or going. And I don't think you do either sometimes. So to make it easy for you, I had a new set of towels monogrammed for our bathroom, especially for you. And they're so nice. The first says hers, and the second says guest. <laughs> So just in case you don't know which towel to use, <laughs> are those nice? These are nice little towels. Love these. Okay, there you go. So just in case, yeah. Okay, right. Now, moving on. Liz, Mark has teenagers. And so Liz is his 16-year-old daughter, and this is what she said. She said, not only is Mark Victor Hansen the father to my sister and me, he's also the father to our 80 animals at our house. Now, I know, Daddy, this may cause you a little stress constantly having little puppies around. So I wanted to give you a token of my appreciation for your years of patience. So we thought it was the perfect time to give you your very own deluxe Pooper Scooper. <laughs> Do you love that? There you go. See, you're ready. All those surprises on your doorstep. You've got something to do with it now. Okay. I've never had one before. Well, there you go. Well, see, there, it's never too late. See, it's like, what do you give Mark Victor Hansen as a gift, right? You give him a pooper scooper. Okay. <laughs> Melanie, his 14-year-old daughter. Okay. This is good. She said, you know, I love the way my father dresses. And I love it when we go out together and he wears his tight red shorts that he's had ever since high school. <laughs> Daddy, you know I love those red shorts. And I feel a little selfish in keeping those shorts just to the time that we go out together. So I think it's time for the world to share in this treasure. <laughs> and after this weekend, we are sending them off to the Smithsonian to be prominently displayed. So before their final farewell, you all get an opportunity, and Mark will, can we have a moment of silence, please, for the last viewing of Mark's red shorts. Here they are. <laughs> now, <laughs> you need to put them on your wall. Is that great? Can you see Mark in these things? Do we really want to go there? <laughs> I don't... <laughs> Okay, was that it? Hold on here. Oh, no, we have more. We have more. I love this. Okay, Trudy is Mark's personal assistant. Trudy, are you in the room? Okay, there she is. And this is what she said. Mark's ability to creatively connect the dots surpasses anyone that I know. The vast arrangement of the people he knows is like conducting a 12,000-piece orchestra. And Mark has the ability to connect all of those people in a way that most people don't even think about. So we wanted to give you, Mark, your own baton so that you can conduct your next unstoppable best-selling symphony. There you go. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I'm not done. We have one more. One more. Isn't this cute? That's cute. That's cool. Do you love this stuff? Okay. And then finally... As you can imagine, Mark travels a lot. So we wanted to talk to his travel agent and kind of get an idea of how Mark really is to work with. This is what she said about you. She said, Mark is a wonderful client to work with. However, <laughs> he does have a little quirk that I continually deal with. And if there aren't five bags of peanuts on his flight, it is not a pretty picture. So, I wanted you to know, Mark, that I've contacted United Airlines, 
and they've guaranteed that the pilot will not take off until you are in the possession of five bags of peanuts. And just in case there's a slip, we have some reserves. <laughs> so, oh, come on, you guys, don't turn on me now. That was the end. So, Mark, thank you for being a great sport. You know we all love you and we appreciate you. I want to introduce the captain of this voyage, Mark Victor Hansen. Isn't Cynthia doing a great job? Give her a standing ovation. MCs deserve standing ovations. Thank you, Cynthia. You go. How do I get off this stage? Uh, to the front now. I moved it to the front. They're moving the stairs on me. Okay, thanks. I got it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Charlie, help people up now. All right. Good morning, everyone. We'll do that again. One more time. Good morning, everyone. And Cynthia, that was great fun, which I didn't expect. Thank you. You know, I believe that uh, daddy daughters ought to have a date. And for my little daughter, the 13, the 14 year old's birthday, she said, "You know, daddy, she's she's a thespian in process. She is uh, just great on stage. She's already sung at Carnegie Hall last year and just melted uh, my wife's my heart. And she's in love with uh, Dr. Bob's uh, son, who's a contemporary in L.A. Anyhow, so." She wanted to go to Lion King, so we went to Lion King, and I got just the two of us uh, second-row orchestra seats. And she wants to grow up and become an elephant rancher and save all the elephants in the world. For some reason, that's her motif. And how many have been to Lion King? Can I see raise hands? It is just so wonderful. And uh, when they come down the aisle, the elephant uh, just came and whacked her. And it was just it was just so perfect you couldn't. And then the next day, I'm doing one of those TV churches up in Portland. And the first song they start with is Circle of Love, and I just turned into a bundle of tears. It was wonderful. One Melanie story, two Melanie stories, and then we'll start officially. Fair enough? Say yes. When Melanie was four, I teach that you ought to take a little vacation or a lot of vacation. Say a lot. Because, you know, obviously the Mosaic Law was work six, take one off. And that's great if you're a muscle reflexer, but you and I are in the think business. What business are we in? The you know, we're here to be information utilities and turn out as much information as we can in an orchestrated, organized way. Anyhow, so I, I now take off a week a month, you know, because I'm going to show you the fun part of writing today in addition to the, you got to have bum glue and lock yourself into a seat and produce a lot. Fair enough? Say yes. Yeah. But we're out when Melanie was four, out in Palm Springs at the Mud Baths, and we're coming back, and everybody's asleep in the van except Mel and I, and Jack had taught me, you never talk down to a kid, you talk up to him because they're born enchanted and with total awareness and all that. So I said, Mel, what do you want to talk about? She says, I got a question. I said, what's that? I said, who's God's daddy? Oh, man. You know, we got so many ministers in the room. That's not the day you get to go back and ask your priest minister rabbi. You're supposed to have done your own due diligence. I said, sweet. <laughs> I said, sweetie, the languaging would be vaulted for a second, but, uh, you know, God is a causeless cause, the numeral uno, and in the Christian model we operate in, you know, the goal is to become one with the one, and then you become invincible and unstoppable. As you, does that make sense? She says, Daddy, I got it. I go, Phew. I said, anything else? She said, yeah, who's God's mommy? <laughs> so, we live down in Newport Beach, not far south of here, for some of you that are foreign nationals and all that. Um, <clears throat> we're at a four-star restaurant called Scott's, a great seafood restaurant, having a family dinner. And Melanie sees this octogenarian couple, people over 80, not talking, not having fun. And in our family, you fight for airtime. Everybody is articulate. <laughs> both kids have read over 2,000 books. They were born reading and writing. And I'm thankful to say they're both distinguished little writers and have been published a lot already. Anyhow, um, she sees that they're not having any fun, so she just takes it upon herself to walk over and start telling them chicken soup stories, because I'm going to teach you that Rick Frischman and, and Steve Hall have got me so much media that we do at least a media day a month where I do 20 to 40 radio uh, shows where you start at 3 o'clock in the morning because that's drive time when people buy books. And Melanie, as a little kid, was you know starting in 1993 when she was littler, would sit in my lap and listen to all these stories. And after you do it two or three times, once in a while I'd hand it and you know Phil would be interviewing me from Empowerment Radio and 
and say, who's there with you? And I said, well, she's seven now, and, you know, would you let her tell a story? And, you know, he'd go, oh, yeah, that's cool. And, and uh, so she walks over and starts telling these chicken soup stories to this little old couple. They start laughing, go hoffing, and the old man says, you got another one? You got another one? And after a few minutes, he whips out a $20 bill and lays it on her and says, that is really good. <laughs> now, he thought she was shilling and hustling table to table to table. <laughs> You know, it is a great restaurant. She comes back and says, Dad, these stories really pay. I said, I've been telling you. <laughs> so today I'm going to launch. We're here to have fun. What are we here to have, everyone? Everyone say, I'm having fun. Point at your neighbor right and left and say, I see you're having fun. All right, one more time. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Last night was the warm-up. Today we're going to start to accelerate, and we're going to accelerate through Sunday. And everyone say, I can handle it. Everyone? Amen. Touch your neighbor's forearm on the right and left and say, you can handle it. Amen. This morning we're going to start going step-by-step step with what we did with chicken soup. I told you that I did uh, my own first book with Keith Green, Stand Up, Speak Out, and Win. I learned about multi-authored books. 1990, Jack and I are... Here at the Polo Lounge, we were members of the Inside Edge, uh, started by Diana Van Wilnitz Wentworth. She was going to show up sometime. Is she in the room? Uh, I'll introduce her to you. But after we were done, we sat down and I asked him about what are you doing. And he said, I'm going to do this book called Happy Little Stories. And I said, well, let's do it together. And we'll do, because he was going to do the stories. I taught him how, you know, how to get standing ovations at the end of talks. Like I talked to 10,000 Marines and they say, we don't cry, but you made our eyeballs sweaty. <laughs> and I said, look, as long as you're going to do it, you know, if you're going to think, think big. How do you want to think, everyone? Yeah. Everyone take your hands. We're going to pretend we're in Texas. I'm thinking taller and taller. Everyone, I'm thinking... Taller and taller. Now, I understand that some of you have uh, come up to me and say, well, you're thinking outside of my believability. Well, look, I sold 20,000 copies the first year. If you sell, start by selling one, and then you sell two, and then you start getting momentum. But if you don't have big goals, your mind can't come to work. So we're going to teach today to have big goals. And I've got the world's greatest goal setter is in the room, and I will bring him up on stage in a little while and introduce him to you, the real Indiana Jones, because he and I have been close friends for a long time. But he will agree with me that you've got to have some goals that are unobtainable. You've got to reach for the impossible star. You've got to dream the impossible dream, and we're going to do that. So then... We interviewed all the best-selling authors. We interviewed 101 best-selling authors. Now, there are a lot of best-selling authors in here. I'll introduce you to all of them. By omission, I'm going to miss a few of you, and I'll apologize in advance. Please accept my apologies. But Barbara DeAngelis, How to Make Love All the Time. What a great title, and it was a relationship book. It wasn't about sex. The first interview I did on radio about chicken soup, she'd endorsed our book, and the guy said, Oh, I see you're endorsed by our friend Barbara DeAngelis, How to Make Love All the Time. She must be tired. I said, no, she's ecstatic. <laughs> you know, <I> just <laughs> Johnny Gray, her one of her former husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Johnny's done so well, he owns two 747s that make a fortune in addition to carting him everywhere he wants. The guy has pushed the edge of the envelope, been on a bestseller list 40 years, got Barbara Walters to do a two-hour special on him. Decided to do stuff that no one's ever done. He's got it. Did his own Broadway one-man show, and it was sold out. Then he's got a Las Vegas show now on permanent station. You got to think through some stuff. Some of you say, "Well, my publisher's not doing any work for me." That's right. Publishers are printers. One more time. What are publishers, everyone? Yeah. Printers. All deference to the publishers in here. I'm not besmirching you, but their job is just to get the book out. Your job is to be a marketing maven. Everyone say, "I'm a marketing maven." Everyone, I'm a. Yeah. Kenny Blanchard. What a guy. Writes the one-minute manager and now runs a $100 million a year operation. Why? Because he started talking at YPO, Young President's Organization. Three guys said, look, you know, you're bumbling along here and it's easier to make a $100 million a year than a million. Why don't you make a little bit more and we'll just turn this into a real enterprise for you? And he said, well, if you'll be chairman of it, I'll, you know, be the spokesperson. We talked about Spencer Johnson, who moved my cheese. He wrote out of the pain of his divorce, but made it into a story that shows that most people sit too much. Most people do what Rita was talking about last night. We procrastinate. You get scared. And what does Cynthia keep saying is, I'm unstoppable. Everyone touch yourself. Say it, please. I'm unstoppable. I'm really unstoppable. Everyone, I'm really unstoppable. Wayne Dyer wrote your Ronnie Zones. He was one of the first guys that helped me get going back on Long Island. He wrote that book. People read it because they thought it said Eurogenous Zones. <laughs> 
<laughs> Wayne's got so many good stories about that. He said, one wife was reading it and came in and said, hot damn, it's my night. He said, if you read this book and change your attitude, it will be. <laughs> Anyhow, you know. <laughs> Deepak Chopra, who's a guy who cracks out four books a year. A dear friend of mine, he is a client of Ariel Ford. She uh, will be here sharing with you. He... Um, cracks out books faster than anyone. He believes he is a... Re now, remember, in the Indian model, they believe in reincarnation. In the Christian model, Augustine took reincarnation out of the Bible, so it was there at one time. We just had it edited out. Now, I don't know whether there's reincarnation or not. I was on the Oprah of Canada's Dini Petty show. All the Canadians know she is probably... Isn't she the finest mind... One of the finest minds in Canada and a dear friend. And uh, I'm on Dini Petty's show with uh, Bob Proctor's mentor, uh, Val Vanderwall. And she says... Uh, Val, do you believe in reincarnation? He said, I don't believe it in this lifetime. Didn't believe it in my last one either, you know. But... <laughs> Chopra thinks he is Merlin reincarnated. And when he writes his stuff, he can just channel it. Now, I'm attending a seminar for the next nine months with, I think, the brightest woman on the planet, Dr. Jean Houston at seven. She was the, is sort of the heir apparent to Tillyard de Chardin, who created the new sphere around the planet, and then Margaret Mead's helper. And her daddy, for 35 years, was a head comedy writer for Bob Hope, so she met everybody, does all these voice prints. But my wife and I are taking three days a month up to be in her mystery school, and she says... In now in quantum physics, there are seven levels to go to, but every one of you can get into a zone where you can write stuff you didn't know you could write. And I've been in seminars with Jean when she, uh, we did Emily Dickinson, and she would give you the first paragraph of Emily Dickinson. We'd be playing some great music like I Am that Ricky just did for us. Give her one more round of applause, if you would please, Dr. Ricky. She writes this stuff that just cathartes my heart. I tell you, she's good. Anyhow, and uh, when you're dealing with that kind of music, it gets you going. And then all of a sudden, everybody in the room, and there were 3,000 of us, all wrote Emily Dickinson, and we had to stand in front of the group and can write it. Everyone say, I can do this. Everyone, I can. Because you get in zone. Everyone say, I'm getting in zone. Everyone, I'm... In athletics, you get in zone. Here, it's easy for me to be in zone because I love you. And like I said, I want more for you than most of you want for yourself. James Redfield, Celestine Prophecy. The guy who, this is a yeah, great book. Yeah, I never got to meet him until recently, but, uh, you know, he was on the cover of People magazine, and it said he was selling 75,000 books a day. I told my publisher, and the publisher said, nobody sells 75,000 books a day. This guy's peeing in the wind, Mark. You can't believe that. <laughs> Three weeks later, we're selling 80,000 books a day. He said, I got to apologize. So I said to James, I said, you know, this is what my publisher said. He said, he never apologized to me. <laughs> We interview Scott Peck. Now, he's a psychiatrist who wrote A Road Less Travel. Twelve years, number one. Told us he made $40 million, But he said, what you got to do is one media interview every day, no matter what. Now, that doesn't mean literally seven days a week you got to do one. What did I say? You can stack them and do 20 in a day. Our friend Johnny Gray does media one day a week. He only does Tuesday unless Oprah or somebody like that calls something big because Johnny is pushing the edge of the envelope and figuring out other ways to do stuff. And he is a master storyteller who used to be a monk. And if any of you have been in his seminars on sex, he starts with a banana, and that will show you how where this guy's at. So. All right. When we started Chicken Soup, we collected 60 killer stories, and we rate all our stories on a scale of the 1 to 10. And we asked all of our speaking peers, Tony Robbins and everyone, Give us your best story. And we went through them, and we were hard on them. And some of you have sent stories to us, and I got accepted. Some of you are co-authors with us. Some of you in the future will even do books with us. But if you ever do a book with us, we, you start at the end. You figure out the market first. Because we don't want to do a book that sells less than $3.5 million. You know, because it's hard to do a book that's going to sell ten or 10000 as it is to do millions. So... One of the tapes I've got back there is how to think bigger than you ever thought you could think. The key issue I teach there is the size of your question determines the size of your result. If you say, how do I make 30 grand a year? Oh, God, please let me just make 30 grand a year. I'll be a good boy or a good girl. That's all you'll figure out how to make. Easier to make 300 or 330 million or something. And there are a lot of people blown past a billion a year that are Horatio members that I'll talk about a little later. It just, you know, with me, it just is amazing. But it depends on the thought forms you hang out with. But you've got to remember, you're here to break the paradigm because we've had a structural change in America after 911. Marshall Thurber is the one who really got me. Cyclical change just goes up and down like a thermometer. Structural change is that a 78 goes to a 33 record. You never buy a 78 again. Then it goes into an audio tape. Then it went to a CD. None of us are going to buy 78 players again. 
After 911, things are different. Who's got to be the lead person here? Everyone touch yourself and say, I am. am. Touch your neighbor and say, I see you are. You You wouldn't be here if you didn't have inspirational discontent. That is a good thing. People don't travel like Lenny all the way from Israel because it it costs time, it costs energy. I don't even know how you know about us, but you know, the internet. Right? Because we now have one world and we've got to make the whole world work. Yes or yes? Yes. Yeah. So you figured, we figured out what we'd do. Then we had so many stories, we had our friends review them, and our friends, we said, be merciless. Now, this is a critical point. Most people write the book, their editor reviews it, maybe their spouse. Not enough. You want the market to review it, the market to review it, the market to review it. Who do you want to review it? The... Well, we did Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul with Jack's sister, Kimberly. We had 12,000 teenagers judge every story and give us feedback. Thank God for Excel spreadsheets and that, because it just goes, and it's instant. When my wife, who will be here this afternoon, I'll introduce her to you, did Kids Soul, it got voted on at Nickelodeon. Six million kids decided it was the most important book they ever read. And a story the parents wanted excised and exercised from that book was on abuse. Now, why did they want it exorcised? Because a person that's bitching and complaining about abuse, physically or mentally, is doing it. And these kids know it. And, and, you know, Johnny Bradshaw's work, and John's a good friend, Dr. Bradshaw, says 50% of us have been physically abused in awful ways. 100% of us have been verbally abused. Do we need to change that kind of stuff? Go like this. Yeah. So we can't. But what, what our friends told us is, look, we said, this means call your mother. They crossed that out and said, look, don't moralize us. Just do this story. The people will figure out the story and what it means. We wanted to have 101 stories with an average high score. Today we won't do a book that has over 30% of them that are a 10++. plus plus. That means it goes off the Richter scale. It's the size of a Bopsy story, which is one of our classics. It's a story like Sparky which is a story about a kid in high school, senior, never gets above a D-. minus. No girls will go out with him. Always chosen last for sports. But like everyone, he has one great talent. Hold up one finger. How many great talents do you have at least? One. At Harvard, Gardner's study, parentheses, says there's seven kind of talent pools, and the trouble with our academic system is not the school, it's the system. We only praise linear verbal skills. What about a guy like Michael Jordan who, you know, just can fly through the air and slam dunk? And if somebody's in the way there, he just slips over and slams, right? I mean, he's changed the sport and raised, you know, he got a $10 billion, according to Fortune magazine, created in the industry, got paid $136 million, and all the poor journalists go, oh, guy's overpaid. No, he's underpaid. As a guy who runs a lot of businesses, he should have got 10%. He should have gotten a billion. He's the least paid guy in sports, not the most. But most people don't know how to think. You're here to learn how to think. What are you here to learn how to do? And I'm going to do some controversial stuff, which will upset you. Is that good? Yes. <laughs> That's what writers are doing. We're here to be provocateurs, evocateurs. The first great writer in America is Mark Twain, and he did such fun stuff. He toured the world. He goes to Hawaii when he's 23 and single. All the girls are swimming naked. They left their clothes on the beach. So he put them all together and sat on them to guard them. <laughs> <laughs> He's my kind of guy. But he was friends with the presidents of the United States until Teddy Roosevelt came along. And what I said a minute ago is when somebody's bitching, moaning, and complaining about something, that's what they're doing every time. And Teddy Roosevelt was a trust buster, so when, when our friend Mark Twain looked inside, he found out the guy was an imperialist. And he got on his hate list and got squashed almost by Teddy Roosevelt. Because he said, I'm not going to allow America... We, he, Teddy wanted to absorb all of Europe into America. Right? We don't need that kind of crap anymore. You know, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt who did some stuff right, but a lot of stuff wrong. Point is, are you here to do something important? The answer is? Yes. Yeah. And I'm just going to give you insights into a lot of people. Have a great title. Everyone touch yourself and say, I got a lot of great titles. Everyone, I got a... Remember not to get sucked into your own title. It is easy, but you start with a title. Where do you start with a... Some of you see, I'll write the book and then I'll get the title. When Napoleon Hill wrote Think and Grow Rich, originally he was going to write How to Make a Boodle with Your Noodle. <laughs> There's another title that sucks. It never would have sold hundreds of millions that it sold. His editor calls up and said, Nap, unless you come up with a new title, Dr. Hill, tonight, you know, we're not going to roll him. He did that sort of the same mantra without knowing Eric Erickson that we talked about the 400 times. I got a best-selling title and came up with Think and Grow Rich. Calls the guy in the middle of the night like 4 o'clock and says, I got it. The guy said, better be good or I'm not publishing your book. You don't wake me up. You got to have a great title. Everyone say, I got great titles in me, everyone. 
Shake your neighbor's hand and say, you've got great titles in you. <laughs> titles are slippery, so when they come through, you've got to get them, write them, dictate them, and carry... Bob Allen's giving me a little dictating machine. I'm not carrying because it's a bunch up in my pocket, but carry it with you everywhere because you never know when you're going to have a little good title. Write down hundreds of titles. Jack and I sat in a jacuzzi one night and wrote 168 titles that we wanted to do during our lifetime because there's some stuff. If you're going to do it, do a lot of it. Get good at it. One of the people that is my... Last night I bragged about uh, Nora Roberts, who we raised so much money for the children. She is the first cover of Book Magazine. Am I on? Is this on? Book Magazine, and listen to her numbers. She is the one that Coca-Cola had her and us on a side of 50 million Diet Coke cases for 60 months. But Nora Roberts rule of the, rules the romance genre with a velvet fist. 69 of her 145 books has been bestsellers. She writes so fast that the publishers wouldn't take her books. She was doing Harlequin books. Now, Nora can't type. Nora never finished high school. Nora writes in a yellow pad. Nora writes 55,000 words a week and finishes one book a week. A week. A week. A week. A week. A week. She writes so fast, she has a pseudonym that's also a best-selling author that sold as many books called J.D. Robb. Point of your temples go, hmm, that's interesting. Everyone say, I can do this, everyone. I can do this. It, you know, I got this whole thing highlighted. I mean, I just, you know, I think you ought to read everything with a highlighter and then put it into your own notes for future use somewhere. Just, what an exquisite lady. And she just thinks through these great stories. And I love her, uh, you know, because she is now selling 40% of all the fiction books written, which is, is, and she did it in a decade. And she writes great titles like Hidden Riches and that in fictions. So write hundreds of titles. Because you sell the book against the title and against the outline. Don't write the book I'm going to teach you again and again today until you sell it, sell it, sell it, then write it. Test your titles in the market. Where do you test your titles in the market? And you always ask the question, what would you pay for? Not what do you like? I don't care what you like. I care what are you going to give me some money for? Winter of 1992, three long years. We'd already uh, approached, uh, we got, you know, an agent that was going to help us to the publisher. Then in 30 days, we got 33 rejections. We went to New York, did the slippery road, and they all said, oh, buzz off. Anthologies don't sell. This is too nicey nice. Humma, humma. And they all said, hit the road, Jack. And I said, it's okay if you don't like him, but I'm one nice guy. You know? <laughs> Now, in our millionaire training, I say, look, whatever your PSI, your primary source of income, most of you call it a job, which is an acronym that means you're just over broke. Whatever that is, you do that better than you've ever done it while you're doing your side income. So Jack and I are still speaking. Jack did mostly trainings in the educational market. He'd sold he was selling like 570,000 copies a year of a book called 101 Ways to Build Self-Esteem in a Classroom. If you're a teacher, you know that is an anchor book. So he'd sold. This is a guy that got free scholarships to Harvard. He was a Latin scholar, and then he became a Chinese scholar. I mean, Jack, I, I couldn't, and he's the, one of the, Jack and Bob both, my uh, current uh, also writer, is who you'll meet a little later. J these guys are such great editors, and, and their minds are so brilliantly organized, where I'm totally fractal. I, I am a conceptual editor. These guys are good. But these people were turning us down, and it was, our wives were respectively saying, are you sure this is going to work? <laughs> No. <laughs> so you've got to expect for rejection. Top it off, our agent wrote us a letter, which I have framed. It says, you're fired. That book will never sell. And that cost him at least $5 million. So, you know. It's the old Winston Churchill thing. Never, 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 never give up. And we're going to read you, consider this out of our writer's soul, which uh, what writer's soul says, I had one up here a while ago. I don't know what happened to it. When we come back, we'll do it. But the consider this, it shows that all the best-selling authors got rejected. Nora Roberts got rejected again and again. But then once you get going, you, do multiple, you have to do multiple publishers if you decide to be prolific. Everyone say, I'm prolific. <laughs> now, why do you want to be prolific? Christ said, the greatest amongst you is servant of all. How do you become great? You become a servant. How do you become a servant? We're serving with words. We're serving with communications. We're serving with ideas. We're serving entertainment. We're serving upliftment. We're serving... The highest goal is transformation, if you've read the experience economy. That's where I want you all to be, is in transformation. Always hold the vision. Get your little crystal ball. 
Because without vision, people, will, people perish. Without dreams, they perish. That's what Martin Luther King says. I have a dream. He never said, I got me a strategic appointment, man. I'm going to figure this out. That is not what the boy said. He wouldn't have streets named after him if he said, I got me a strategic appointment. No, he didn't do that. You've got to have mega leverage. So we solicited every one of our audiences. We said, look, if you be so kind... If you like the stories I tell, would you buy one of these books when it came out? We came to BEA. We went to the book expo where another 140 people turned us down. And we had these little coupons filled out from 20,000 people. And when Health Communication took us, they said, well, we'll let you do it if you buy the books at $6 each times 20,000. So we were desperate. So we needed to get distributed. And they were down. We didn't know it at the time. Financially, Bradshaw stuff wasn't selling at the moment. So we did it. So spring 1992, we went to BEA, sold ourselves. The breakthrough advantage was the 10-speed press. You know, if you ever have a prayer of thanks, thank 10-speed. I talked about it last night. But find a niche that nobody's looking at. There are all kinds of niches. I just worked for the world's biggest roofing company. If you think about it, everything is under a roof. We're doing a book with them. Why? Because it fits. Everything's got a roof. And these guys are going to finish global warming because most of the heat is lost out of the roof, as they say in Canada. Right? So there's all kinds of markets. Our biggest book ever that's coming out is Chicken Soup for the Grieving Soul. We pre-sold six million into funeral directors, crematoriums, cemeterians. You know, SCA, service, whatever that, is anyone here with SCA? We've got a lot of friends that are funeral directors. You know, they're the last to let you down. <laughs> None. I'm just wondering how far I can go before I burn somebody. Okay. <laughs> I love pushing the edge of the envelope. Everyone take your hand and say, there's rainbows of markets in front of me. Everyone, there's rainbows of markets. The best market hadn't been tapped yet. Who's going to tap it? Everyone say, I am. Now, somebody last night said they were going to outsell me. I hope you do. I want good competition. You know, if you're the second dog as a, in one of those iterods, you've got an ugly thing to be looking at all the time, I'm telling you. you know. I like being the lead dog. And we're doing a book called Chicken Soup of the Ocean Lover, so with Wyland, and what we're dedicated to is cleaning the oceans. And we're going to paint 10 miles of the Great Wall of China right before the Olympics. And we're going to do cage fishing to save 34% of the ocean. And John Goddard, who I'll introduce to you in a little while, is going to go with us. And he's one of his goals that he hasn't done is he always has wanted to kayak down the Yangtze. And he's going to take those who have galloping chutzpah and are, uh, don't care about their life very much. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to go down the Yangtze together, and uh, you got to sign your own life away. Because <laughs> you're here to have fun. You're here to have adventure. You're here to have a good life. Yes or yes? yes. So all those publishers turned us down at ABA. We walked up to them. And, you know, what you got to do is know how to handle a rejection. And then we left a copy with Gary Seidler, who uh, read it overnight with Peter Begzo, and they cried in their silk shirt, and they said, well, we'll try it, you know, and they caught the spirit of it. So everyone say, I expect rejection. Everyone, I? But I, touch yourself say, I'm rejection proof. Everyone, I'm? Eleanor Roosevelt, if you go to her house in Hyde Park, New York, as long as that wall of marble says, nobody can reject me without my permission. Everyone go, whistle. There's so all kinds of people have gotten rejected, so that's not the issue. So you just reject the rejection. When you get rejected, here's what you shout. Everyone together? Stand up quick. Everyone stand up. What do you say, everyone, when you get rejected? Yes. You may be seated. Ross Perot was the top salesman at IBM, made $287,000, got fired for making more than a chairman years ago. His wife lent him $1,000. He started EDS, Electronic Data Systems. Knocked on every door. Everyone said no to buy a little company. What did he say? Yes. 81st door, he got a... He knocked on 80 doors, got $4 million. You divide 80 into $4 million. He got paid $50,000 every time he said? Yes. Everyone said, I can do this. Everyone, I can. Yes. What rejection does, it seems to me, my philosophical bent on this, is that universe is testing you to see if you really want it. 
If you got it in your heart of hearts, now a lot of you have had healing experiences, and some of you need healings, and tonight after this is done, we'll do some healings. Because in the first chicken soup, I wrote that story about Amy Graham, about how we had a lady that was dying, and, and we had the whole energy audience send her energy, and, and uh, three days later, she was in remission, not seven years later, and, and uh, she's totally healthy, got two babies, lives down in San Diego, and is a dear friend. The point is, we're going to do that at the very end. We were prepared to self-publish if nobody else would sell it. Everyone say, I can do this. Everyone? I can do this. At 4 o'clock, my mind was rocking. I was already giving you this talk. And the richest guy in Australia is a guy named Peter J. Daniels, who is a nobody, nothing, went bankrupt three times, used to be a bricklayer, and then started buying houses and flipping real estate and doing well. But he studied all the 1,500 biographies and autobiographies of the superstars, everybody. And he said all of them had what Churchill had, a sense of destiny. Now, what does that mean? In my language, I say you are coded at DNA and RNA at birth to do something great. Everyone else say, I'm coded. Everyone, I'm to do something great. Everyone, to do something great. So, for a whole year, Peter takes notes in his little notebook, and then he does it at talks, and, you know, he's been head of the ministries in Australia and Asia for Mother Teresa and Bob Schuler and on and on and on. But then when he decides to write a book, he writes it in 14 hours, 14 hours, 14 hours, 14 hours. Because some of you go, well, man, I've been on this dang book now seven years and I'm getting after it. You've been procrastinating. What did Rita say now? Do it now. What do you got to do? Do it and get it done. He doesn't write a book unless it makes him five million dollars. And he sells all of them himself. There's a lot of you in here that know Peter. What am I saying? You've got to get off it. You just get it done. Oh man, I'm having so much fun. I just want to live at my little computer. No, that isn't the game. Get it done. And if you've got to self-publish, you can do it. Writing the book is only 10%. How much is it, everyone? 10%. See, the industry teaches you when you're done with the book, you're done. And then they say, you go on a little 10-city tour, you go on a little 20-city tour, and you're cooking. No. 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 I'm sorry, Mr. Mentel. Uh, now that you've been published, I'm afraid you have to leave our writer's group. Here's the truth, and I've interviewed everybody. I interviewed 101 best-selling authors. James Michener, you name it. I've interviewed them. Clive Cussler, every one of them. It takes us a saint. Same for a chicken soup book, and a lot of chicken soup co-authors are here, and I hope to introduce all of them tomorrow. But the point is, unless you do ass-busting behavior for a year and a half, and you are relentless, it ain't going to work. Not me, man. I'm now under Mark's umbrella, so I just, just I get to do my little cool dance. And it's going to happen. No, it isn't going to happen unless you do the butt-breaking behavior to pull it off. You've got to be relentless. It took us a year and a half to sell a million and a half. And once it starts smoking, it'll keep going. But you've got to keep doing stuff. And you've got to come up with breakthrough ideas that no one's ever done before. Do some stuff. Just like us painting the Great Wall of China. That is a cool idea. Us doing cage fishing like I saw in Ireland to save all the endangered species. Cool idea. Somebody's got to clean the ocean. Now, my belief is you either do the governmental route or you do the entrepreneurial route. I think the government... Is the President of the United States got time to worry about the ocean? To go like this. Head of Russia going to do it? No. Japan? No. The U.N.? They haven't got a clue. <laughs> this is how he did it. Everyone say, I love writing great books. Everyone, I, I love writing great books. You know, you got to write a great book. And then what you got to do is decide. There's a lot of ways. You either make it as specific as possible to a marketplace that needs it. Like my optometrist is the guy who created orthokerontology. This is a contact lens that reshapes your cornea like braces reshape your teeth. And I said, look, you can do better. And now he's got a drop that he's just finishing the FDA approval. It's taken him way longer than he ever thought. But he drop that an enzyme that makes the eye loose. You put a hard contact lens in, and 20 minutes it goes back to 2020. He puts another hardening agent in, takes off the lens. You never need contacts again. Now, 60% of us need glasses, bifocals, trifocals. Zig said when he got his trifocals, he started walking like this. You know, <laughs> We're doing a book together called No More Glasses. Right? What I'm saying is there's markets within markets if you're awake. But for chicken soup, we did it as universal as possible. We said get a panel of diverse readers, your future buyers, preferentially, that are going to read the book. 
We said again and again, you've got to have the great title. Here's some great titles we talked about already. Who Moved My Cheese? Chicken Soup of the Soul? One Minute Manager? Think and Grow Rich? Prayer Your Best? Fish? Just great little stuff that you can read. Have giant goals. Uh, John Goddard, would you make your way up here, please? John Goddard, would you come up? Have giant goals, and you've got to believe in them. By the way, I had his book up here. Uh, Trudy, bring me his book up here, please. Oh, you, you got one of them? Okay, good. John Goddard is the real Indiana Jones, according to Reader's Digest. This is the greatest goal setter of our time. The guy who, when he was a kid, set 127 goals. They're all outrageous goals. Everything from, he's the only guy I know that's read the whole Encyclopedia Britannica. He's climbed every high mountain. He's flown the fastest planes. He's learned multiple languages. He is exceedingly humble, and, and uh, I may be embarrassing him, but I don't care. Because <laughs> I love John. <laughs> Tell these people why they ought to set giant goals, John, if you would. Because we all need to be stretched mentally, physically, spiritually, daily. And have you ever heard a greater, more inspiring, more zestful motivator in your life? No. <laughs> By the way, would you tell them what you said to me one Christmas? You called and said, how's the mental? Do you remember that? Oh, how's the mental master done? Oh, good thing. Uh -huh. This guy... <laughs> You know, I grew up and I wanted to be a sesquipedalian. That's somebody who I read did Webster, and that's how somebody who has the omni-efficacious use of the right word in the right place at the right time to get the right result right here and right now. This is that guy. <laughs> Go ahead. What about setting goals? Tell them about some of the most exciting goals, and then how many times you almost died doing. <laughs> Wait, but pass this around. You got to. By the way, this cover. The real John Goddard, world's greatest goal setter, survivor, 24 spine chilling adventures on the edge of death. This is the cover they put on Reader's Digest that he got the rights to do here. Pass that around, Charlie. Take a look at it and pass it around. Go ahead. Tell some of your most exciting stories, if you would. Well, raising five children uh, <laughs> successfully. <laughs> John, come on. Well, do, do, do the white rhinoceros that you rode and all that. Well, they varied, you know. Uh, I was a sesquipedalian from the time I was 10, and uh, I would read two and three books every week on my level and increase that as I went through the grades. And by the time I was 15, from all that reading, just as with you, you get ideas for things to do, to places to go, people to meet, things to achieve. And I didn't write the goal list in any regular form except the first three or four, and that was to explore the Nile, Congo, and Amazon rivers. And it took me 10 months to carry out the Nile expedition. It's the longest river on Earth, 4,220 miles. I know I paddled it in a 16-foot, 60-pound kayak, being charged by elephant, rhino, hippo, capsizing rapids. I had a little problem. I came down with malaria, amoebic dysentery, tapeworm, a staphylococcus infection, and amoebic dysentery. And there were no doctors. <laughs> Aside from that, I came out pretty good. <laughs> and then I went the length of the Congo River. When I was five, according to my folks, <clears throat> I announced to an uncle, when he asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said, Explorer. I couldn't figure out how to make a living doing that until I was 16. Went to the Okefenokee Swamp and the Everglades of Florida to fulfill goals. And uh, studied the Seminole Indians that first encountered the field of anthropology. And I said, I'm going to be a cultural anthropologist explorer. And it's this been is wonderful. Dr. John Goddard. I didn't want to <laughs> underestimate him. I'm sorry. But, you know, it's enabled me to live with people all over the world, from pygmies in Central Africa, Australian Aborigines, headhunters in New Guinea, uh, punk rockers in Hollywood, and uh, <laughs> fascinating tribal people. <laughs> Have you noticed? They all look and smell alike. It's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, um, I specialize on river tribes, from the sea in New Guinea uh, to the fascinating tribes of Uganda, Sudan, Egypt. And uh, we had a little problem with people in Egypt because the rumor went ahead that we were Israeli spies out espionaging. So we had five stoning attacks. And one Pasha told us in Cairo, he said, well, you did a great thing in exploring the Nile for the first time, but your greatest feat was to go through Egypt alive. So that was interesting. But throughout the world, I've found warmth and hospitality and friendship, and I really feel a citizen of the world now. What do you want to do for the ecology, John? Uh, I've been an ecologically sensitive person all my life. I started uh, diving off the California coast not far from here when I was 12. By the th time I was 13, I was a pretty good surfer, and bringing home a lobster abalone and fish every Saturday 
for Sunday dinner, but never more than just enough for one meal. And in traveling around the world, it's heartbreaking to see the pollution and the total degradation of environment. We have absolutely wiped out 50% of all our rainforests of the world, and I have visited them all from the Olympic Peninsula in Washington to the Congo rainforest, which is probably the last great unspoiled area, only because of tribal warfare. And um, to go into the Amazon jungle and see 150-foot trees cut down and a steady progress of decimation because of stupidity or greed or apathy is just heartbreaking. If you were to tell them three things they got to do to make sure they set exquisitely exciting goals like yours, what would you tell them? Uh, you, first, as you always emphasize, you write down the goal. You think big, as you've always expressed. In fact, we're such kindred spirits on every level. We reinforce each other, and I come here to get regenerated every time. But uh, I have a little formula for doing over 500 goals. Now, the last one was uh, mushing a dog sled in the winter-bound wonderland of the high Sierras. But I have picked... By the way, he was on TV doing this. Tell him about who was with you on that one. Oh, that was on Dateline, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> they uh, filmed me on six different occasions during different goals, and the sequence that turned out the most interesting was uh, mushing the dog sled. And I'm a little embarrassed to tell you how long that goal took. But the last thing in my formula is persist. Never give up. Never. But you pick, plan, prepare, and persist. That's my formula for doing 540 goals. I still have 60 to go, and they're getting really hard now. Uh, meeting Madonna to chew her out for her obscene behavior and <laughs> her bad example for young people. No, I didn't. No. <laughs> so much. Carol is his wife. Carol, would you stand up? Give her a round of applause. She has put up with him and been enthusiastic, and, and she is an absolute love. We've shared a lot of meals together. We've... Uh, been to 28 countries together, off the beaten path, been through the Grand Canyon three times with the most raging rapids in the United States, eight and ten foot shock waves. Uh, we've been through the wilds of Africa six times together and even been to the back country of Nepal and Thailand, elephant safari there. She's as tough and brave as any man I know. Good. Tell about uh, your flight down at uh, Miramar, would you? We'll finish with that. Oh, that was a thrill. I learned to fly on the Air Force. I was a flyer for two and a half years. I've had the privilege of flying 40 different types of aircraft, including 17 jet fighters and bombers. And can you imagine what it's like to fly at twice the speed of a bullet after paddling 20 and 30 miles a day down the Nile River? <laughs> <laughs> if I flew over the Radisson, you wouldn't see the plane. You'd hear all the windows breaking. And boy, would I be in trouble from all the sonic booms, but I've enjoyed flying the aircraft that have been participating in Afghanistan and knocking out the Taliban military targets, the B-1 bomber, the F-15, the, F, uh, the F-15 Eagle, F-16 fighting Falcon, and if you saw the movie Top Gun, the star of that was not Tom Cruise, it was the F-14 Tomcat. Carol has sat in the cockpit of six different of the latest fighters and bombers. I think the only woman I've ever known to have that privilege. Give my friend John a standing ovation, if you would, please. This is one of the greats of all time. Thanks, John. I said the beauty last night of writing, one of the many beauties, is that you get to have the most eclectic friends. As you can see, he and I never run out of conversation, and he takes me on adventure hikes. That's the, the operative word being adventure. And they're dangerous. <laughs> We're walking through the bush one time. And he goes in and pulls out a snake. He says, have you ever milked a poisonous snake? I said, no, and I don't think I want to. You know, he, that was one of his goals. I learned how to do it. Okay, so back to it. Chicken soup goals. We wanted to do a year and a half, a million and a half, and a year and a half. That our goal was uh, $5 million and ninety-five. you got to have goals that are one-year, ten-year, twenty-year, and hundred-year goals. Most of you, we're doing a book called Chicken Soup of the Geriatric Soul with a top gerontologist. If you're over 40, you're interested in aging. And I'm also doing another book, as I said, with Art Linkletter because he's 90, almost 90 in a couple of days and, and uh, ageless. You've got to have, to live long and prosper, Nanu Nanu, you've got to have stat purposefulness. You've got to have something to do. Goddard is ageless because he's got all these cool things that he wants to do. And, and uh, you know, ask him about him at lunch. He's here for the next two days with us. Ten million books by 96. 
by near 2,000, 50 million books, you've got to have the money so when something changes, you, I teach money freedom to get time freedom. So you can do some cool stuff. You're not supposed to be just writing all the time. I mean, Sidney Sheldon plays six months a year and writes six months a year. And he's a guy who did I Dream of Genie and all that. Um, Cynthia, the room has gotten a little too cold. If you could get that uh, fixed, please. Okay? <clears throat> Our perfect 2020 vision is to sell a billion books. Now, no one in nonfiction has ever done that. Is it doable? Yeah. Are we on schedule? Yeah. You can do anything, but you've got to put it in writing. Ancient wisdom, Habakkuk says, write a thing, write a thing. What do you got to do? Make it clear. What do you got to make it? Clear. clear. Clarity in the biblical sense is definite, certainly. Write a thing, make it clear, and it shall be established on you. The minute you write it down, you've got it. All you'll do is catch up to it in time and space. Right? See yourself in the best le- seller list that matter. The one that bookstores historically buy from is New York Times. Now, Barnes & Noble's doing their own, and Amazon does its own. And, you know, we, we, the, when we came out with Bob's last book, we got Amazon to get it to number one, and we're going to do that. I'll show you how we're going to do that in a few minutes with our books. Publishers Weekly, USA Today, has got the top 50. We said visualize to realize what you want. The 3 by 5 card is a card we handed out last night. We'll hand out another one. We said tomorrow, do it in bright colors and sign it. Also, put it on your mirror. Where do you put it on your Some of you read the book called The Magic of Belief by Claude Bristol. And he said, the reason you put it on your mirror is because it goes through the portal of the people into the depth of the soul. The minute you get fixed to your thought, it manifests. Jack and I had all the goals that we were best-selling authors before we became best-selling authors. It's great fun. Meditate on it day and night. And before you go to sleep at night, do thought projection. See yourself as you want to be, not as you are. Because the greatest... Nation in the world is the imagination, and it's the only nation that has to have future realization. You've got to keep dr- pulling yourself into the future with exquisitely exciting stuff. You do not have to know how it's going to be done. In Romans it says, God's ways are past finding out. God knows how. All you've got to know is, what do I want? Touch yourself, say please. What? One of the tre- things that Jack and I do in our Hawaii seminars, we have everybody sit with each other and say 50 times in a row, Charlie's been there, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? And after a few minutes, you know, you get past the car, the house, the perfect spouse, kids that graduate, get out of the house, or whatever it is that you want, right? Hopefully you've got, and i got great kids, and we love our kids. The, the point is, is that pretty soon you find out what your real core values are, which is the real critical determinant on a go-forward basis. But you've got to meditate before you go to sleep, real critical upside down I start some seminars and Chip Collins I'll introduce him to you tomorrow but he's my mentor in the back will you wave Chip give him a round of applause right there this is a guy that got me launched and speaking and he'll talk to you tomorrow but you know Chip and I used to talk about this and I wanted to earn 100 grand a year that's 400 dollars a day so I go to bed my mantra would be 400 400 400 400 400 well the first day I did it I wake up 258 in the morning and I got this guy's name and I write down the name never heard of the name the next day I'm out cold calling buildings to sell insurance and there's that guy's name I go in there's no secretary at the desk his doors open I go in and within five minutes he gave me a check for 400 dollars he said I didn't know whether you were ever coming back but you seem so enthusiastic and it felt like I should give you the check you know it just is fun to and by the way, the difference between earning 400 a day and 4,000, the world's best salesman, Ben Feldman, said is one zero. What is it, one? Zero. Now, Michael, if you've been earning 400 a day, you got kids? Okay. Uh, anybody that you love? Some of you. Okay. <laughs> Let's say their life depends on you earning four grand. Can you figure out how to tenfold yourself in a day? Of course. Right? You can do stuff you didn't know you could do. It's like when Melanie was little. She is our most experimental kid. One night, Patty and I are asleep. She comes down to the bedroom at 11 o'clock at night and says, Mommy, Daddy. And I go, uh-oh. She says, would it be bad if somebody sniffed in a pussy willow? My wife, who's a triple rim sleeper, goes, You did what? She said, it's right here, and it really hurts. So, you know, in California, we have Doc in a Box. There's a little emergency center. So we went, we went to the Doc in a Box. He couldn't do anything. And I said, look, because there are people out there bleeding in car accidents, and it was a mess. But she's in pain, and she's a little kid. And I said, look, buddy, just go into deep meditation and controlled reverie and just real quick, three deep breaths, and see the answer, because you don't know how to solve this problem. And it ends up, he, golf, he golfs with a, a, a pediatric eye, ear, nose, throat guy. We got to him at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. The guy just had this tool that went up there and pulled that thing out without too much pain but you know because there's always a solution what is there always a but you got to meditate that you're going to have the solution and then obviously listen to those visualizing tapes so you know how to do that stuff 
Here's the card, what we used to do, because you've got to be increasing. I said, like Bill Gates, it's not just for Bill Gates and Michael Jordan and, and uh, Michael Dell to be growing 100% a year. Everyone say, I can do it. Everyone? I can do it. You're born. Your standard equipment is there, but most of us don't make the decision and let the subconscious make the provision. Then you write it, sign it, date it, get somebody else to write it, sign it, date it, upgrade it every month. How often do you upgrade it every month? Write a wow of a business plan. We already said one, five, and a hundred years out. Harvey McKay is just in Japan with the richest guy worth $80 billion. says, can I see your goals? The guy shows him a 300-year plan. <laughs> Harvey says to this guy, how are you going to do it? He said, patience. <laughs> you know, Invest 90% of your time marketing, selling, hustling, hitting the street, figuring out new ideas on a regular basis because they're out there. How do you get them? You think about them. You ask for them. You talk to everybody. Make sure you attend Book Expo. For those of you who've got friends, we're doing one of these as a mini one-day seminar right before Book Expo. It's on the front inside cover, which you know I've asked them to do. If, you have, if you're just selling it yourself, have a booth, and Dan Pointer will take you articulately through this, how to do all that stuff. If not, go anyway. It's a great experience. When Jack called me up and said, look, we're going over to the, the Book Expo, I said, man, I've been on the road almost every day this month. This is the only... I only got two days off, and I need to be with Miss Patty. He said, look, we've got to go there. We'll just go for two hours. I've never been to Book Expo. We go to Anaheim. we got backpacks full of three-ring binders with chicken soup for the soul. And uh, I didn't know we were going to get rejected all day long. But uh, we went there, and I walked in this place, and it was a mental orgasm for me. I just went, whoa. <laughs> Because everything ultimately turns into a book. Every movie is a book. Every play is a book. Every story is a book. Every song is a book. Margie Thatcher was there. Muhammad Ali was there. Steven Spielberg was there. It's the who's who, but 60,000 who's are all there. And you get to touch them and get pictures with them and have fun with them. And there's no other place you can go that they give you free books everywhere you go. They got every sort of block in this thing because it's miles and miles of books. I mean, there's books on everything. You'll be astounded. It, don't let it intimidate you. You've got to go in there strong. How do you go in there? Strong. And you breathe deep and you stay centered. You stay grounded. You send your chakras down to the center of the earth and bring it back up green and strong so you can just handle it because it's sort of overwhelming. Because you see all the people that you've watched on TV and stuff. It just is really amazing. And then you take your little books to UPS and have them mailed home. So it just is so cool. Selling, marketing, and self-promoting is a way to go. Be innovative. Everyone say, I'm innovative. I'm innovative. Now, Marshall Thurber brilliantly teaches that, innovative happens that innovation happens at the edges. It never happens at the center. That's why corporations hire guys like me that push their envelopes. And guys like Marshall and guys like Bob, right? Remember, the publishers are basically printers. You, who's got to make it happen? Everyone say, I'm making it happen. Everyone, I'm... You're the fulcrum that creates the leverage. And a new leverage that we've written into this new book sort of looks like this, because we're trying to teach how to have a million-dollar dream. If this is what leverage looks like, the fulcrum is you, right? And what happens is it hears your dream of a best-selling book, right? And what happens is that most of us are alone. This arrow means alone. Well, you've got no leverage here. What you've got to do is get a big lever out here, and leverage is speed, so this leverage will make it move easy once you get your mentor, once you get your mastermind, once you get your team, once you get your network, once you build your system, system, system. What do you got to build your system? system. Clem Stone, in his book titled Build a Success System That Never Fails, I hope all of you read my friend Og Mandino, the guy who wrote The Greatest Salesman in the World, just a little book, but Og Mandino was a drunk. His wife, by a $35 gun, couldn't kill himself. Goes into the library because he's in New Hampshire and he's just freezing his little booty off like we all are. Just think heat. Everyone think? We're going to make the room a little warmer here in a second. but <laughs> We can relate to poor Og. Anyhow, a book falls off in front of him and it's a success system that never fails by Clem Stone. He reads it. He walks all the way to Chicago to work for what it was then called Combined. Now it's called Aeon Corporation. And he starts writing how to sell all this stuff. And Clem Stone reads his writing and says, man, this is so good. You've got to write for us. Ends up being head of Success Magazine from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock every morning. He said, then there were no phones in that. He wrote The Greatest Salesman in the World. And he's sitting in a dentist office and he's reading an article. And it's by Frederick Fell on golf about, uh, who's the great golfer? Ben, before Tiger. Yeah, Ben Hogan. And uh, calls the guy, ends up getting the book published. Amway got started pushing it through their system and ended up selling $38 million, right? But you got to, you got to get started. Chip and I had breakfast this morning, and, and he said, the thing that you get these people to do is get started. 
Right? But I want you to start and I want you to go fast and get it done. Get it done. Get it done so you can go forward to the next one. The rule of seven started out as your, in your script. It says a rule of three, but I've improved it. <laughs> and that's nice coloration in rainbow here. But you've got to do a, some things every day to get the process going forward. Make that telephone call that you're afraid to make. We got the directory, the catalog of catalogs, and before Christmas happened, we were on the cover of three, let's see, there were, th- yeah, there were 300 catalogs that we got on the cover of, like Rosebud Catalog and that. Just, it's amazing what you can do, but you've got to do some stuff we're going to teach next, which is bypass marketing. We showed you last night, I, I did not do a good job, my staff said, telling you, you've got to have this product. You can have this whole bag of goodies. It will change your life. It will change your future. And normal people pay $813.95. Individual show price would be five fifty three. But today, it's special to you, four nine and nine. And if you don't want to carry four hundred pounds home with you, we will mail it. With the exception of Israel, you get to carry it, Lenny. You know the rest of you in Australia maybe, but. We'll mail it home for $10, and we want you to have all that stuff. Okay, make sure you read the book that we did. How many of you read this before you got here? Looks like about 20%. Great. It's a fun book that we did. Here's the book I told you about last night. I'm going to reiterate what I said, because this is a model that everyone can do. Everyone say, I can do this model. Everyone? Dr. Jeffrey Lant, Phi Beta Kappa Harvard, writes five-page content-rich article in two hours. How many hours? Sells them three ways. Three ways he sells his little five-page content-rich articles. Number one, he does his little articles and he sells them at, I think, let's say $7 each. And he calls them special reports. Everyone say special reports. You know, and I said last night, how to get the green stuff stuffed in your mailbox. Number two is he gives them, gives them to small circulation magazines. Magazines like, you know, they got a 5,000 population circulation. So that editor every month pulls his or her hair out and says, Oh my God, how am I going to fill this thing? Right? Where am I going to get a copy? All you got to do is ask. What do you got to do? You know, and before you get your book out, you want to ask for the cover of a lot of magazines. And because 80% of the books are bought in November and December because they're Christmas books, Fiction, nonfiction. You want to ask for the cover to come out in November and December. Everyone say, I can do this. Everyone, I can. Right? And then, by the way, be generous. If you like some other author, after you're done, say, by the way, I'd like to recommend Sally and Sammy and Harry and Harriet. Then the one, the special reports that sell are the ones that he turns into a book like this book. First time I bought stuff from him, I bought $458 worth of these little content-rich articles, and I didn't realize that they're just little inserts in his book. But he, again, <clears throat> he writes from January 1st to July 1st, publishes a book for $40, self-published, self-published, self-published. How did he do it? Self-published. Now, he had a mailing list, I don't know what his numbers are now, but 650000 and he knows he'll sell 20000 40 bucks. walks out with 800000 goes to Europe for a month and buys Grand Masters, which he has all over his place. Now, he storyboards, meaning Disney does storyboard where he does pictures of what he's going to do a year in advance, so he stays excited about what he wants to know about, write about, study. But you get the writing done fast, two hours, two hours. That's all he writes, two hours. Makes $10 million a year. He says it in the front of his book, so it's not, I'm not... All I want to do is help you understand that as a one-man army or a person, a one-human army, you can do a lot. And this book we went through, we, I read it first and I highlighted it and I scored it. Then we wrote little yellow stickies and, and Jack's office not far from here in Culver City at the time. Now he lives in Santa Barbara. But maybe it was as long as that. We had 1,094 yellow stickies and we put them all over the wall. All the stuff that his book triggered and the next book I'm going to tell you about triggered. And we said, holy God. Then we prioritized it. Then we wrote that wow of a business plan. What a wow of a business plan means is if you and I sit on an airplane, you look at it and you go, wow! Everyone? Wow! Most of you, I just want to go through life and be dull and boring. No, this is not the case. That's not the way to go through life. You want to have wonderful, uplifted, inspired friends that you just decide you can do stuff with. 
This guy's stuff is out to the right. John Kramer's a dear friend of ours. Kramer's book and Lance's book are the ones that taught us how to market books. There's some other great books. Some of you may be writing them, may have written them, but a a thousand and one ways to market your books. John's only got two tapes. He's only done two tapes his whole life. He's helped sell gazillions of books because that's his goal in life. And his stuff's out right around the corner. You've got to have it. Do everything he suggests because the guy is the student of students of how to market books. If you're busy, hire somebody else to read it and do it for you that has a vested interest. Parentheses. You've got to be careful who you give vested interest to. You, do, you, you know, the line is you know them by the results, by their fruits. You pay them after they get the rubber hit in the road and they, they have a deliverable. You don't Because everybody will come up to you and say, oh, I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you. Give me 25%, give me 50%. Don't give anybody percent until after the game's done. And it's contingent upon results. Contingent upon results. Because everybody wants peace. Dan Pointer is the first web-centric author. I'm so extended. Dan, are you here yet? This guy has made a fortune in a niche that none of us... Does anyone, by the way, that hasn't heard Dan before know what he writes? He's made parachute books. You say, well, there's no market for that. Right, there's no market in a bookstore for somebody that wants to parachute. But every year on George Bush Sr.'s birthday, he parachutes with George Bush Sr. He's made $7 million selling parachute books. Because if you're going to parachute, you've got to read about it. He knows everything about it. <laughs> he knows how when that parachute doesn't open, how the color of your pants change. <laughs> He is going to take you places you don't even know. But he's got 500 free pages on his website. Do you want to model that? The Rules of the New Economy by Kevin, a guy from Wired Magazine. I don't remember his last name. McNeely, is that it? Kelly. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Marshall knows all this stuff. Marshall owns a thing called Ed Edge where he reads a book a day and then every month he does a business book and and, uh, explains why it's good and interviews the person in depth and all the major corporations buy it and use it and, and expand it. But... This guy has figured out how to give it away. In, in uh, New Rules, what is the title, Marshall? New Rules of the New Economy. What this guy says is the most important thing is free. What's the most important thing? Free. free. So in every talk, we give away free stuff, but they've got to go to our website, and the only way they get it is to give us their name, address, and email. Because your goal is to get a database. What's your goal to get a? Database. It's easy to get a database. All you got to do is ask. They'd love to give it to you, but you've got to give them something for it so there's a little reciprocity and change. Hire your own PR person. Most people think guys like Captain Outrageous, Ted Turner, don't have a PR agent. They absolutely got a PR agent, right? Frischman is here, and he's going to do a great job. Bob Newman does a great job, right? These guys... You know, if you hire them, now you can do it yourself, and they're going to, and Rich's going to teach you how to do it yourself. So does Steve Hall, Steve Harrison Hall. But the the point is, you can also hire somebody like Frischman. You pay a certain amount of money, he guarantees a certain amount of press, and then if he gets something bigger, like get you on Oprah, that it's a different charge. But you need it. Remember what we said: road less travel. Scott Peck, one interview every day, no matter what. Twelve years made forty million dollars. Do three interviews a day to get the thing going. And at the front end, just so you get... Some of you say, well, (laughs) I'm scared. Start with a 10,000 watt or less station. Nobody's listening. (laughs) Just go to your library and look through it. There's 18,000 radio stations that do interviews 24 hours a day. Start small where nobody's listening except you and that person on the phone. And if you screw up, they'll cut it. The gentlemen in the media are desperate for what they call... He or she gives good radio, meaning that they're entertaining, they're lively, they're original, they're different. They push the edge of the envelope. They've got something to say. And when something goes wrong, I can call them instantly and get a copy, get copy that's going to make sense and be front page news. Like during the Canadian Olympics, um, you know, Canada lost because that French woman said, I don't give a damn. I will cheat. I will help the Russians. That's not French. Sorry. Anyhow, sorry, sorry, sorry. Bad accent. I apologize. So they called me and said, what should be done? And I did this half-hour vamp. And I said, look, this take adversity and turn it into asset and advantage. And what we'll do is we'll tour them all around the country. And then a day later, they got the gold medal. So a double gold medal went. But you've got to be able to give good radio. And everyone say, I got the answer. Everyone, I. Deep inside, you got answers you didn't even know you had. 
It's like when you give yourself those outrageous titles and you start writing. And I write at least two hours every day. Usually I'm sitting on an airplane. Norman Vincent Peale said, look, airplane is your office in the sky, buddy. If you're going to do this business, go be a talkaholic. Just don't talk to anyone and just go. I do not tell people what I do in a plane. Usually they say, what do you do? I say, I write a little. And they go, you do not. And I go, that's right. <laughs> you know, just keep working. Because <laughs> I'm not there to impress them. You're there to have fun. Stephen Hall, Harrison Hall actually, owns radio and TV interview report. It goes out to all 18,000 media outlets every month. I don't know what he charges. It's not very much. It's pretty nominal. But you can get a full-page ad in there. Your phone will ring off the hook, and then you decide whether you want to accept it or not. And, and I told you last night about my friend Paul Hartuni, and he uses this kind of stuff. And he sorts them. When they call in, they say what the radio station is. He looks up on the list, finds out how many watt they are, and if it's not big enough, he won't do it. Because one of the books he wrote, which self-published, I think he's made $7 million with it, is called How to Find the Outrageous Love of Your Life in 90 Days or Less. And they say, well, how are you the expert? He says, well, if I'm not, who is? (laughs) Gotcha. You know, you got to... And by the way, you're going to get objections to different stuff, and you've got to handle it. Like, when we got the cover story on L.A. Times, Jack and I had finally arrived, and the journalist interviewed the publisher, they interviewed Jack, they interviewed me less, and the guy just went for my juggler, and I thought, oh, man. So the first line in the L.A. Times, front page, you know, this is home, right? You're never a prophet in your own city. First line was, if you like chicken soup for the soul, you got oatmeal for brains. <laughs> Second line is that if you love Forrest Gump, which this guy had no idea that our boy was going to win the Oscar and everything for Forrest Gump, because Forrest Gump, he said, is a dumb movie just like their book. It's about shoes. If you go back and look at Forrest Gump, the whole movie is about his shoes. Did the up machine. Me and Bubba. You know, just great stuff. Media training. When you get big shot on the media, make sure you got media training. In the book, I think we list uh, Joel Roberts. Any other media trainers in here? I want to make sure I don't miss anyone or besmirch anyone. And, and Rick will recommend some people, and you know Ariel will recommend. But you got to get media trained because you ha- cannot go on Oprah and blow it. You look back and go, I just blew five hundred thousand sales. We were never on Oprah until we were six years in it, and I've been on her show three times, and our goal, of course, is to go on on October 2nd when One Minute Millionaire comes up, press the button, raise a million dollars, give it to her charity, which is, you know, Jack and I are already Oprah's angels, and, and i got to tell you that Cynthia has built more habitat houses in America. We just did, sit in Nepal, we helped, Patty and I helped finance some of those houses with her, but Cynthia and I and a little unknown comedian named Robin Williams and a guy named Arnold Schwarzenegger, and, and a writer of Braveheart and, and uh, Randy and, and a little movie called Pearl Harbor. We all built, helped build these 20 houses in one day. That's why you want to be an author, so you've got cachet value and you get to hang out with some people. There's no other way you're going to get to hang out with. And I want you to be enormously chal- charitable. That's why we call it being coming an enlightened millionaire. Somebody that does it comes from abundance. Somebody that creates massive value is charitably philanthropic and makes a massive difference. But you've got to know how to handle the media. Because remember, some of the media, there's two kinds of people you go into in media. The people that are there because they look good. And I just look good. I'm a dumb, dumb, but I really look good. The next question I bet you'd want to ask is, you know, and you just give yourself the questions because you might as well. And then you've got the one that really knows. And 20% of those people just want to decimate you just because that's their job, to rip you apart. They think that's their job in the universe. And, and you're allowed to get up and walk off. And you you know that presidential debate with Ross Pro where he didn't like the person. He walked off and it caught him and it put him on a butt. But, you know, get media training. Get as many covers of magazines as possible. And uh, I'll just hand this one around. This is the only copy I got. But um, we uh, did this great cover with Peter Montoya for um, Personal Branding Magazine. Oh, good, 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 good. Oh, wow. We'll hand these out. We'll pass these around. Two. Well, sorry, sorry. But uh, this is what personal branding magazine looks like. Did Everyone got a copy of your magazine when they checked? You all read that thing last night about uh, one of my heroes, Michael Jordan? So you can pass that out. I'd like those back, though, please, when we're done. Changes Magazine was our publisher's magazine. Priority Magazine is Steve Covey's magazine. I want to know, when you're an unknown, how do you get on these magazine covers? <laughs> Because it's not that easy. I, I don't even know that I've been on a magazine cover, and I've sold a lot of books. So how do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
You got to ask, 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 ask. What do you got to do? By the way, to get those magazine covers, do we get turned on a lot? What's the answer? Yeah, yeah but everyone, shake your hand, shake off rejection. Say, I'm rejection proof. Everyone, I'm. Yeah, Speaker Magazine is the National Speaker Association. You ask for it. Most people don't have the galloping hoods, but ask for it. Everyone say, I got courage. Everyone? It's a French word meaning strength of heart to ask for that stuff. TPN, I was doing all our video shows, and, and uh, when I was doing the videos for TPN, there were only three people they had that came that had more than one hour of real depth. When you're doing one-hour TV shows and they're trying to do uplifting media... It was Jim Rowan and Brian Tracy and myself, and, and I've got to be careful because I'm besmirching somebody potentially, but it, it is, you know, most people, I want you to keep doing stuff, creating stuff, writing files. I said last night, PowerPoint your stuff and just keep going through it. So, and then you look at the magazine and you say, what is it that, what is on their worry list? And if you're talking to the journalist or the editors or you go to the magazines or the newspapers, when you're sitting with them, and by the way, the, play, the way to break in is the little magazines. What magazines? The? How many, what's your circulation right now, Peter? 10,000. So he's at the front end of this thing. Do you have a magazine at your place yet? Yeah. You do have a magazine? We, 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 have, uh, we have a newsletter. Okay, come up here. Come up here a second. I want to introduce you to a guy that is a man I just met last year at Horatio Algier. This is a guy who started the Rainforest Cafe. He uh, owns Famous Dave's, which is a NASDAQ stock that is just uh, skyrocketing. He is the uh, most outstanding chef I've been with. This guy used to test every herb in his mouth. And, and uh, when you're with him and he does food, it, you just uh, drool, hand, hand him like Famous Dave. It feeds 50,000. Give him a round of applause, if you would please, my friend Famous Dave. And you have a newsletter that it goes out to how many? Well, every restaurant that we open, we we drop ship uh, these newsletters to, I think it's 40,000 people within an area. But our, everything that we do is, uh, one, one of the things that we learned is that mass, mass media is dead. And everything that we do is word of mouth, and we, we create a, a way that, uh, people go out, they, they got to come to our restaurants, but it, it's, it's all word of mouth. It's all this type of stuff. But I will tell you um, that in 1986, I was bankrupt, didn't have a single dime, and, and then uh, started reading Mark Victor, Dare to Win, 1994, Zig Ziglar's book, and uh, it, it's all mental. If you, you could start out with nothing, but if you believe in your heart that you have a dream, this incredible country, because I, I both of my parents were orphaned by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and then today I, I tell people, as mu- a couple years ago, I lost as much as $50 million in one day. But I tell them, you should have seen what was left. <laughs> <laughs> tell them how you got in Harvard. Um, and tell them how much school you went to before Harvard. Well, my story is this. There's three things in my life. One, I've been through alcohol and drug abuse treatment, and, and I don't mind telling people that because it just shows that in this country, you can do incredible things. Today, I live a sober life. But when I was going to, when I was in school, uh, I, I was in the bottom half of the class that made the top half possible. <laughs> I, I, I had C's, D's, and F's. But then, uh, I, in 1972, I had met Zig Ziglar, and my auto. By the way, I just he wrote me last week and wants to use my life story in his autobiography. Perfect. Uh, I, I uh, you all got a handout I saw that uh, had success. For, success for Dummies. My life story is in that book. Uh, so I go get the book. But uh, one of the things is, is that not, uh, when I was graduating, when I graduated out of high school, I swore I would never pick up another book again in my life. And um, I, because I, education wasn't for me. But today, I am a ferocious reader. I'm on a rampage of learning. Every day of my life, since I heard Zig Ziglar tell me to start listing cassette tapes, I've had a cassette player in my car. I listen to books on tape. And um, I don't have an undergraduate degree. But today, I can stand here before you and tell you that I have a master's degree from Harvard University, and I did it in nine months. Wow. 
Last year, Dave and I met at the Horatio Alger Awards, and, and uh, I fell in love with this guy. Tom Harkin, the guy who helped me get the award. You, to get the award, by the way, it's the equivalent in business of an Oscar, an Emmy, a gold medal, and a Tony. It's just that important, and there's 500 of us, and, and I'm going to introduce one of the recipients of our scholarship here in a little bit. But um, Dave and I met. We liked each other. The first time he calls up and said, I, got, I can help you. And By the way, I, did I ask you for any help? No. He brings out an entourage to my office. One of the ladies says, uh, you're going to be on 8 million cereal boxes. And another guy who is his musician friend says, the most sold records in America are sold at what store? Target. <laughs> no. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this. You talk about selling books in places you never think about. Do you realize or, or do you have any idea where the most classical music is sold? Think of anybody? Well, I guess... Victoria's Secrets. The most classical music. And, and the most jazz is sold at Starbucks. That's what I'm saying is you've got to go to the off-markets. There's off-markets. Who created it? Somebody like you by, and I went By there. the way, the, you know, they talk about Mariah Carey only selling a couple hundred thousand CDs of her, you know, it didn't sell. Guess what Starbucks in their first CD release sold? What? Three million copies. Just, just from Starbucks. So it's incredible. Markets that you would never think about, there's a lot of opportunity. Okay, two things. One is we talked last night about maybe giving them a free cup of coffee at one of your restaurants if they ever come in and use your name. <laughs> if it, I tell you what, anybody, if you come see me, I'll, I'll personally autograph a, a, a peg, and I'll guarantee you if you took that to a Famous Dave's restaurant, they, they, would, give you free, they would give you a free meal. So okay. that's my gift to you. Okay, wait. Now, one other thing. Go ahead. Give him applause. He deserves it for that. Because her question was, can, can they ever write anything, a paragraph for your newsletter or anything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then last, tell them what you're doing with your kids' camp because of what you want to do for the Native Americans. Well, one of the things, like, like I said, both my parents were orphaned, and I really believe that uh, prior to my sobriety, I was like a lot of people, a lot of my goals are financial goals, and, and that's when I kept failing. But uh, then I come to realize, I, I really believe there's three times in my life I should have been dead, but my life's higher purpose today is to make a positive difference in the lives of other people. And, and so we've... Uh, been working with at-risk Native kids. We've created this Life Skills Center for Leadership, and we've taken kids that were getting high and drunk every day of their life, kids that were getting kicked out of school or on the verge of getting kicked out of school, and today are on the A and B honor rolls, and, and today they have, they have dreams of their own. They have hope, and I think that's one of the most critical things that we can give our young people today is hope for the future because, you know, when I was growing up, we used to hide booze in our locker. And today it's incredibly different because kids today are hiding guns and bombs. And, and it's about time that people in this country, especially leaders, start standing up and we start getting our kids back in churches. We start getting our kids uh, developing principles and values. And that's the most critical thing that we can do is to start giving back to the youth of this country because they are our future. Give them a round of applause. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. I told you I was going to introduce you to my eclectic friends. I mean, you know, they're doing such wonderful stuff. When you do your book, you've got to have the equivalent of a movie trailer. You know, when you go to the movies today, you get 15 minutes of the next 12 movies that are coming out. In your book... When you write the book, the first thing you do is write the advertising copy. What's the sell? What's the benefit? What's the mega appeal? But then when you do the book, you've got to have some stories in it that are one page or just one paragraph. Because when you heard Cynthia articulately say, well, I went to some bookstores and they wouldn't, nobody showed up because they aren't good at promotion. Most of them are run by pimply-faced kids that are lucky to get the books on the shelf, you know? Should you enroll them in your dream? The answer is yes. I went to the world's biggest uh, shopping mall in, in uh, Edmonton, I think. Is that where it is? Edmonton? Or, yeah. And um, 
its own anyhow. So I went there. Nobody showed up. So you, I started grabbing people out of the hall. And I said, Paul, please, read this story called The Gift. Read the story of Bopsy. Read Puppies for Sale. And they go, oh, this is really good. And I made sure everybody in the store read it. So I created a thing. Then I bought balloons. And they had a little uh, spikes on top of their bookstore. And I broke them. And I got cameras. And everybody that walked by I got a picture of me with them holding the book. Then they felt obligated to buy the book. <laughs> you got to do whatever it takes to get them to do what you need to get done. Give out pages that help. Our publisher one day was with me while I was doing this, and some guy started to walk away with a book, and he ran down all and grabbed him. He wasn't going to let any books go. Okay, so free reprints. This is what we said earlier about the whole computer business. It's got to be free. One of the things I want you to have is an article I've done. I, we give you a lot of free stuff at my website, but get idea tithing. Four years ago, I was spokesperson for the American Red Cross. They're out of blood. Lizzie Dole. I said, look, I'll get to... Ms. Dole, I'll get you the blood. How many chiropractors do I have in a room? Look around the room. At least uh, 20 in here. They're all friends of mine that have been in my seminars. Doctor, how many times have you and I been together? What? 20? In, yeah, 20, whatever. I, and, you know, so what I did is I sent out, you know, a fax blast four years ago. And I said, look, we're out of blood. And I said, if one of your loved ones goes to the hospital and they need blood, and there's none in the end when they get there, they are called dead. We do not have pseudo blood. I've never asked you for anything other than maybe to buy my books and tapes and videos. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of these docs, like you know, I know I can name six in here that I can see that are all multi-million dollar practitioners, and I helped a little bit. You know, they did the work, but I showed them the models and interviewed all because uh, that's a side thing. Anyhow, we did a fax blast. Out of 62,000 doctors, 30,000 of them instantly called 800 Give Life, uh, called all their patients, said, Look, we're going to adjust 100 patients, but you've got to bring somebody new to the practice. We'll adjust them free if you'll give a pint of blood. And in one week, we went up 300,000 pints of blood. So all of a sudden, this thing hit me an idea tithing, because God gave me the commission to get people to give. Because most people, if you want to know whether you really give, all you got to do is look at your checkbook, look at your wallet, see how much you give. Most people are pretty stingy. And as long as you're stingy with God, God's stingy with you. It's a real easy deal. You know, if you ain't willing to give, you don't get the invisible force to work on your behalf. It's a real simple deal. <laughs> One hand clapping. Anyhow, okay. So, read that. I would love to have you read it and go forward with it. Anyone might review your book. Ask everybody. But you've got to get momentum and then you get reprints. What Cynthia says, how do you do it step by step? You start with the little publications. There are... 14,282 different magazines in America. All you got to go is to the magazine of magazines at the library. There are so many, and they're in your neighborhood. They're in your little city. All, do all the weekly newspapers and talk to the weekly newspaper. The weekly newspaper people in your little home city are pulling out his or her hair. They'll give you 10 pages of free copy if you'll go and interview with them. You know, especially if you figure out what they need and what their hot button is and what their issue is. Befriend the gatekeepers. There's gatekeepers to absolutely every industry. In this industry, it has been, but it is changing right this minute. But it has been Ingram. The guy who ran Ingram has just left, so I haven't got my access there. And that means maybe you can or can't get in. But Ingram's in Nashville. 33,000 little independent bookstores all call and say, I need two of this, three of that, four of that. And then they always ask the same salient last question, what's hot? So every year with every book, we went down to Ingram. The last one we did was Chicken Soup of the Golfer Soul. We gave a free golfer soul to every one of the 126 telemarketers. We gave them a free breakfast. You hug them and kiss them. They call up and say, what's hot? Say, you ain't going to believe this. This book is the hot. This book's outselling Tiger Woods' book. We sold, and our partner was uh, Golf Digest. You've got to partner up with somebody, right? And, if, and the way you partner up and answer to Cynthia's question of a minute ago is you figure out what's the benefit to them. Start out as, what are you going to give them? What are you going to give them? What are you going to give them? Right? What are you going to do for them that's going to help them? Because And every executive has a gatekeeper. And you can get through any one of them. You can get to anyone you want if you know how. Everyone say, I know how. I know. Yeah, just figure out how. And then you got to learn how to speak. I'm going to talk to this more tomorrow. And if you haven't ever taken Toastmasters, you ought to do it. And Dale Carnegie, that's spelled wrong, sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll just go past that. <laughs> when you're doing your book... Like last night, what did I do? I read you stories, and we sold at least 100 of these. I want all of you to have it. But when you watch Zig Ziglar talk, at least in the old days, David Cooper, didn't he? He used to, when he was standing, uh, his original book was titled Biscuits, Pump Handles, and Fleas. <laughs> 
But then all of a sudden, somebody told him, do it, see you at the top. So Zig would go, you got to... And if you'll do what I've said today, we will see you at the top. Well, he'd do five minutes and he'd bless the audience. It was like holy water, man. He just, you know. And people would say, he's, Pete, he's done forgot. He got a book in his hand. He never forgot. By the way, David, when we did those PMA rallies, didn't he, he'd have 14,000. St- and he'd just go like this until everybody in the audience would get it. Right? Just... It, just phew. <laughs> Enroll other speakers to sell your book. We went to Career Track. They ultimately did a set of videos with us, and the head of that is, is a lovely friend of ours still. And Fred Pryor, while well, his company was around, and national seminars. We got the seven seminar companies to do it, and I did all the telephone training. And every lunchtime, you know, once a week, I was on the phone, and they'd say, Brazil's here, Argentina's here. You know, and they'd, go, they'd list off all the countries, and then I did 20 minutes of training of how to sell our books from a the platform. Then we got all the dentists to sell our books. You've got to figure out how to get into a market and get before them. We got all the people that did th- uh, uh, nails. What do you call those people? Thank you. And uh, <laughs> pedicures. I've never had one, so I don't know. What do I know? You know, they don't let me do this kind of stuff. Be selective. If you can, request a budget of the store. Ask them to put you in the stuffers. Ask them to put you in the bags. You make them up. You make them up. You make them up. You stay in touch with the people. Because once the publisher, if they help you get to the bookstore, and ask other authors which bookstores sell. Like here, you know, we got the... What's the one in Denver is called? the Tattered Cover. And the one right here, the biggest one is called? Bodai. Bodai, yeah. Two lovely guys, Phil and his partner, run that thing, and they just, you know, they'll get you 600 people standing in line. Why? Because the people that come there are author addicts. They want to meet Ray Bradbury when he comes out. They want to meet you when you come out. And they trust that these guys will bring in the best. Make a commotion, which we talked about. Get pictures with everyone. Right? Schedule your media around promotion. Now, if you can get on a big radio show in the morning and say a 10 o'clock show that everyone's listening to and say, I'm going to be at the bookstore at 12, like I did Kansas City. I was on the radio show at 10. 12 o'clock, I went. We had like 400 people standing in line. They'd all bought the book, and it was just so much fun. But you've got to figure out how to do it. Befriend the bookstore owners. Bookstore owners are people. What Bob and I have done is figured out how to make sure every bookstore makes money. Bookstores thank Chicken Soup because we kept their doors open during bad times. Because we figured out how to bring the traffic in. Because all of you, you say, well, I'm the author. You should represent me. No, they got 100,000 books. They don't care about you until you care about them. Figure out how to get people into the bookstore because they haven't got a clue. They don't even know how to think. They're in the business of, of, of staying broke, they think. Anyhow... One of the, it's a job, which is one of the things we're teaching this fall, is how to make sure your bookstore makes an extra million dollars with our book. Do you think 33,000 bookstores are going to get on a telephone call with Bob and I? Go like this. We don't know how to do it. But we got the idea, and we'll figure it out between now and then. I always drop in and sign books wherever you are. If you're going through an airport, go into the bookstore and sign every book. Carry stickies with you have to. Sign by author. And ask them. There's three, pe- four, three or four pieces of real estate you want. You want the front window. You want the cash register. You want their high volume stuff. And you want their end aisles. Now that is usually bought by a publisher. But you can ask for it. Because the local bookstore manager doesn't have much power, but they got enough power. If you got signed books, you are at the cash register. You're sold out. And then you do the exquisite next thing. Like if Dave were running, uh, you know, instead of restaurants, I'd say, Dave, now that you and I are friends, uh, you're going to call the company and you're going to send them a little note and send me a CC that we just sold out of the 10 copies we had here at, at Barnes & Noble. Is that true? Or Books a Million or whatever, right? Doesn't matter. Create a videotape. Create a videotape. Every bookstore now has those little videotapes in the sky. Do you know that only four authors have ever created videotapes for them? Make your own videotape, 30 seconds, because that's all you're going to get when a person's walking by, and they'll do it. And if it sells your books, they'll keep playing it. We also did it at all the 7-Elevens and all the mini marts. When you went into a mini mart, you got to hear my voice, and it says, you have a choice today. You can either have a listening story, or you can read National Enquirer. And our books started to sell in the mini mart. You know, it was weird, it was dumb, but it worked, you know. Promote it in the bookstores. Have your publisher by the front, the window, and the end aisle positions. That's what we talked about already.
Now, there's two kinds of places that books sell by and large. One is the bookstores. Your Barnes & Noble is now biggest, and then Borders, and then Books a Million. Books a Million, you ask them, can I come down and do your meeting for your 500 salespeople? And you do it free. You pay them to come in. One of the... Um, I was just down at, in Birmingham, Alabama at their headquarters, and, and uh, the guy who wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff's name is... Richard Carlson. Dr. Carlson and I were together. He's one of the guys that attended this, learned all the stuff, and then did it. We do the 500 executives. Then we said, well, we'll we'd said in advance, we'll go to your biggest bookstore because we're friends and we're not competitors. We did a mailing to the schools because he saw that we did the teenage market, so he did Don't Sweat the Small Stuff for, for Teens. Five schools shut down. They bought 13 buses or 14 buses per hour. We were there until 6 o'clock. These kids came in lumbering with books, mother, soul, and every other soul because we asked them to. Made the front page of the Birmingham paper. Who did that? Richard and I. We said, we can get all the kids to come out. They shut down schools to meet the authors. And we hugged every one of those kids. Do you think they'll be fans of ours for the rest of their life? Go like this. But the bookstore didn't do it. The bookstore didn't do it. Books a million didn't do it. We did it. Who's got to do it? Everyone say, I can do this. Everyone, I can. Chris, come up here real quick. This guy has been flying to attend my seminars from around the world, and I absolutely love him. Tell him what you do in the shopping center land. Our organization is a trade association within the shopping center industry. The shopping center industry in the U.S. is very significant. But in Europe, which is where I run the business, it's to do with retail and retail and shopping centers. The point is that it's not all about shopping centers, it's also, also about the retailers. So our role is really to provide, um, as a trade association, as much information on development of shopping centers, research information, basically education, and also building business across the world. So U.S. companies who want to contact people in Asia or Europe, it's our job to bring them together. Now, do shopping centers want traffic or don't want traffic? <laughs> I, I just want to, I want to make sure you understand from an insider's insider, how many square feet of shopping centers do you guys help control? It's impossible to say. I say that simply because in Italy, for example, 2,000 square meters or 20,000 square feet is a shopping center. In certain other countries, that is just a, a shop. Like in the U.S., you have huge mega malls. In Europe, we don't have that. So it's, it's impossible to say worldwide but there are numerous millions upon millions of uh, shopping centers in terms of square feet around the world. And are they desperate for these people to figure out how to get foot traffic in? They're absolutely de desperate. There is uh, so much that shopping centers today need on the basis that, as you know, after September 11th, there was uh, a downturn, certainly in the U.S. In Europe, it wasn't the same thing because in Europe, there's a shopping mentality. So it's totally different, but there is a need to grow traffic, absolutely, and in different and new ways. Because malls today have realized that what they're lacking very much is the community. We don't provide enough of community uh, awareness, support for the community in which those shopping centers are situated. So today the role is really to understand and bring back the families, the young people, uh, really grow that whole area which has been neglected because we've simply said, you come shop, we'll take your money. That's not the way it is anymore. There's a much more humane awareness in the shopping center industry and of course what I want to do in my little role is to grow the awareness within the industry so that we start to support those people who aren't particularly part of the industry. So if any of these people came to one of your malls and one of your peers and said I got this great idea and you bought into the idea they would do a great deal of PR to make sure that was inundated is that correct? Yeah. Mark says in many of his uh, presentations of course it's a different awareness the shopping center industry is very structured what we're doing is we're saying think differently, whether it's from an architectural point of view, from driving traffic into the malls. It's very, very different. And we do need a lot of support and a lot of help. It's not necessarily that easy to get into because it's still very much um, within the box, as we'd say. But that's what we're all here to do is to help think a different way. And that's what I'd like to achieve. Good. Don't, are you open to letting them ask you questions throughout the two days? Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't know what you'll ask me, but uh, you're more than welcome to come and talk to me. And if I can help you in any way, I'll certainly do so. Give him a great round of applause if you would, please. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Remember what I said. What's on their worry list? Their worry list is how do we get foot traffic? How do we get people in there? How do we get people that uh, attract people and attract community and create awareness that no one exists before? Whoops. I've got to go back one slide. Go back one, please. The club stores, the Costco, the Price Club, the BJ's, the Sam's, 
Right now, of all the toys sold in America, 50% of them are sold at Walmart. The game has changed. Sam Walton figured out how to deliver what people want and deliver it at a price that they want to pay. Costco, when we did our books and we're selling... By the way, to be in Costco, you've got to be selling 20,000 books a week. They've got to be blowing and going. And they don't, it's not, they don't like Mark or Jack. Got, the book has got to sell and blow through there. It's on a skew. And what happens is that when Costco was selling so many of Chicken 1 and Chicken 2, we were number 1 and number 2 in New York Times at the time, we got called up by Saul Price, who created Price Club Costco, and then they merged. And now, as you know, Sam uh, uh, Warren Buffett has owned, just bought half of Costco. So that's how fast this game keeps changing, who the players are on the scene. And you've got to pay attention because, you know, you'll bump into these people. Once you know who they are, and you put them in your little... I've got a future diary book out there. Once you put them in the pictures, the people will show up in your life. Anyhow, Sam, uh, Saul... Uh, had been in a couple of my talks, called me up and said, look, Mark, you are blowing and going with this book. We need you to do a cookbook. I said, Saul, I love you, pal, but I don't do cookbooks. He said, my first order is a quarter million. I said, Saul, we can do cookbooks. <laughs> you know? And then we sold so many so fast that here in L.A., with uh, Ariel's help, we uh, found Union Rescue Mission, and we fed L.A. on Turkey Day. It was my cliché. And we fed 10,000 homeless people, and we made the front page of the paper in L.A., and we made the front page of USA Today. Just because we were doing something, we had the world's biggest bowl of soup, because you've got to keep innovating all this stuff. Everyone says, I love innovating this stuff. Everyone, I... All it is is you're thinking, and everyone says, I like good thinking. Everyone, I... We'll take a break in about five minutes. Be creative with bypass. We talked about the salons, the chiropractor, dentists, doctors, the hospital gifts, supermarkets, restaurants, Internet. Bob's going to talk about how to do that. QVC. When you're on QVC, you've got to, they have a monitor reading in front of you. And some of you are going to say, boy, that's crass and commercial. But you're in the middle of nowhere on any one of these places. And QVC is in the middle of Pennsylvania. You go to Philadelphia, and then you drive to nowhere, and then you're there. But you've got to be selling 5,000 books a minute after one minute on, or they take you straight off. Some of you say, well, it's not nice. The business isn't... That business isn't there to be nice. That business is there to hustle a lot more product than anyone's ever hustled. Because Barry Diller figured out, somebody will watch this. There are little old ladies out there that have their credit card there, and they go, boom, and they're on ready dial to get this stuff. It's amazing. Her question is, does QVC create your script? No. You've got to create your script. Everyone says, I love creating this stuff. Everyone, I, I love when you're on the cruise ships, figure out how to get them in those things. Those things are booming. And those people have nothing to do but read. And the people on cru- that the cruise ship things decide what the books are. So you can just call them and ask them and get them on there. It's wonderful. Get on the airlines. On every airline, whether it's Delta or whatever, they have that little voice in the sky that you can switch to channel 8 or something. We've been on that a number of times on the different ones. Get on the audio channel. Get in their magazines. Their magazines, some of them are slow, low circulation, like Com Air is part of a little Delta. If you can get in Com Air, you can bunce up to Delta. They've all got little feeder lines. The little feeder lines have their own magazines. Get in those magazines. It is relatively easy. Find a mentor, right? Jack and Bob and I have never seen anybody great that didn't have a great and inspiring teacher. It just happens to be the way it is. I mean, Bob's teacher, as he'll tell you, was Dr. Steve Covey when he was getting his MBA. And what Steve taught him is a book is not a book. A book is a lead-generating device. What's a book, eh? A lead-generating device. Now, Covey has sold 12 million books, been a friend of ours, a competitor of ours, an editor of ours, all kinds of good stuff. But Covey has turned that into a billion dollars. Twelve million turned into a billion. He sold out to Franklin. Now it's Franklin Covey. Right? You can take in levels of stuff if you understand the formula. I had a teacher that never taught me that until Bob came along. Now I understand. It's a new game. And and, uh, he'll take you through how that works. But your mentors matter. Right? Because Bucky Fuller taught me a book is a baby and it will outlive any other baby you got. It will be eternal. It will go forward. And that's why we're going to teach you under legal what I learned uh, later today is you've got to uh, make sure you've got a good attorney to uh, set up your estate. So uh, my estate attorney here is, um, also does The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz was written by an insurance salesman named Frank L. Baum. His estate takes in $100 million a year. And he's been dead 50 years. Why? Because people keep buying those costumes like you know the Tin Man and stuff like that. Get tons of ideas. That's what you're here to do. Create big events with media hoopla. Like I said, feed LA on Turkey Day. 
And we had a guy come there that said, until this happened, I didn't know that if you came to Union Rescue Mission, they'd get you a GED in a year, that you had no sex, no drugs, no booze. They'd dry you out. They'd teach you how to clean yourself up and get a job and give you a skill in a year. And he said, before I came here, if I slept out at night and took off my shoes, somebody would steal them. Now as I'm leaving here, thanks to the boys from Chicken Soup, he said, I've got three job offers, the lowest of which is a printer is 40 grand a year. American Red Cross, they got a million and a half volunteers that they sent out notes. Once we got them blood, they thanked us. All those volunteers bought books. Chicken Soup for the Soul 3. Nobody had ever had a third sequel. Outsell 1 and 2. And in one week, we went up the list to number 1 on every list. Why? We gave first without expectation of return. You couldn't know it. Cancer, we did Chicken Soup for the Surviving Soul which was panned by the oncologist. Why? We're teaching people that, first of all, don't get sick. <laughs> Second of all, figure out how to, you know, what did Hippocrates say? Be your own healer at the front end, right? And hurt no one. Don't let iatrogeneticists hurt you. That means doctor-induced uh, problems. Anyhow, the, the point is, is that we got panned, but we st- that book, because we have 88,000 people a week told they got cancer, that book just sells consistently. It's never stopped selling. Why? Because it's got stories that really get people at heart and soul level. Like a great Hispanic man had a head of hair, and that was his mantle into the universe, and he had four little kids. And after chemo, they knew he was going to be bald. And his wife and the four little kids came, and as he's coming out of his uh, coma, he's in tears because he knows he's got, has lost all his hair, at least for a while. And his kids and wife had written in lipstick on their shaved bald heads, Daddy, it's you we love, and not your hair. <laughs> oh, man. Have a great readathon for literacy. We did that. Just do cool stuff. Red Cross was just a wonderful company to work with and still work with. Create a series rather than one book. So you got sequels of sequels. The Teenage One sold so well. We did Teen 2, Teen 3. The Teen Journal. We've had parents come up and say, I can't believe it. That saved me two years of therapy. You know, <laughs> Teen Soul Letters, we just came out with tough love for teens. They're great things. You know, when I was on TV with our good friend uh, Bob Fulgham, everything I need to learn, I learned in kindergarten. Fulgham looks like Santa Claus. If you've never seen him, he's a little round guy with a big white beard. And first time, I didn't know who he was. He came up and kissed me and said, I'm so proud of you guys. You're going to make it. We're on CNN. We filmed it the day, a couple days before Christmas. And his first question to me is, when are you going to do chicken soup for people who've had too much chicken soup? You know, and he just, you know. Marcy, are you in the room? Marcy, come up here quick. Marcy did a lot of the books with us, Chicken Soup for the Woman's Soul 1 and 2 and a couple other books. And I just wanted to tell you one story, if you can. She and I do tons of stuff, uh, and, and she and her partners have had such great fun. Do you have a mic that you could hand her? And we'll do it. Marcy Shimoff, would you tell them one or two experiences of, of Women's Soul? I literally just got off the airplane, so... Welcome here. As you know, they're all true stories. It's a true story about an older African-American woman. It takes place back in the late 1960s. She was driving along a dark Alabama highway very late at night when her car broke down. So she got out of her car to flag down some help. Unfortunately, no one would stop to help her. Now, to make matters worse, there was a pouring rainstorm. She was soaking wet. Finally, after a long hour of waiting... A young white man pulled over to help her. It was very uncommon in the South in the late 60s, but he was very kind to her. He put her in the car, he took her to safety, he found her a taxi, and he sent her on her way. Now, he noticed that she was in a very big hurry, but he didn't want to be nosy, so he didn't ask why. Seven days later, there was a knock at his door. He opened up the door, and on the doorstep was a giant console color TV and stereo. And along with this gift came a note. This note read, Dear Mr. James, thank you for assisting me on the highway the other night. The rain had drenched not only my clothes, but my spirits as well. Then you came along. Because of you, I was able to make it to my dying husband's bedside just before he passed away. God bless you for helping me. Sincerely, Mrs. Nat King Cole. (laughs) <laughs> Go ahead, give her a round of applause. She's great at finding the story. What's the greatest thing you learned to sell books that would help them? Everything I learned, I learned from Mark Victor Hansen. 
I learned just to talk to everybody and tell stories to everybody on every airplane, on every, every you know, really, as Mark taught us, he, I don't know if you've talked about this already, but he did five things a day for media when his book first came out. And that was their commitment to do five things a day. So just wherever we went, talking to people and getting on radio shows, all of those things. What were the first couple of things that you did? I did the Carolyn Marilyn show with you. And then the Carolyn Marilyn show canceled. <laughs> but it wasn't because of us. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just think going around doing media, doing satellite tours... Is that what you're asking yeah. me? And then one time we bumped into each other in Atlanta Airport. Mark is relentless. Wherever there is a bookstore, he will sign books. Even after he'd sold 50 million copies of Chicken Soup, he doesn't let up. We meet in the Atlanta Airport, and there's a bookstore there, and he goes in, and he's, you know, he's got a half an hour between flights, and he goes in and he signs every book, every Chicken Soup book they have in the store, and probably every other book they have, too. <laughs> Any other final words of advice, Mark? Oh, uh, you know, I, this is a good opportunity. Mark didn't even know I was coming, I don't think. I, what I have found in working both with Mark and Jack is that the generosity of their souls, the genero the, the they didn't need to share chicken soup with other people. They didn't need to bring in other co-authors, but they did it. And in being so generous as to bring in other co-authors, it built up even what, what a great thing they already had going. So what I've really found is that the people who are the most giving are the people who really get the most in return. So I want to really thank Mark because his soul and his heart are absolutely big and full. He is truly the good man who deserves chicken soup for the soul. So. Good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Just give her the mic. Good. All of you uh, that talked to my staff said the most important thing to me is how do I get paid? What do I get paid? The royalties usually start at 6 to 10% if you're going to go to a publisher. And what they want is they want a minimum of two books. They don't want you to be a one-song wonder, a one-book wonder. And if, if you really come in with a plan, an idea to extend it in line, extend it vertically and horizontally, you can go anywhere. Average advance at the front end is 12000 90% of them don't pay out, meaning that the author doesn't work hard enough. The publisher is just a printer. He, he or she doesn't generally make it happen. Established authors earn up to 20%. Your big authors like Danielle Steele and Stephen King and John Grisham are 50%. Well, I'm not allowed to tell what my new percentage on the new books we're doing is. I beat their percentages. <laughs> okay, lessons I learned, just real quick, and I will take this 15-minute break, is make sure that you have a great intellectual property or entertainment attorney. The first attorney we had was a real estate attorney and a numbnuts and didn't know anything, didn't suspect anything, and lost us $3 million because he was just an idiot. And he just didn't know, but we didn't know. And so I'll, I'll blame our half of it on us. Permission, if you're going to use anything, you've got to get a permission, even down to a quote. If you're going to use John Kennedy's, ask not what you can do for your country, but what you're... Not, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You're supposed to get that permission, right? Do not do anonymous. If we've had lawsuits, most of them have been on anonymous. <laughs> that great story in our first book about uh, footprints in the sand, about two people walking, and then there's one set of footprints, and guy's looking down from heaven with God and says, Look, there's only one set of footprints. He said, Who do you think was carrying you? We got sued by two people that claimed they had done, wrote it the same day, one in Canada, one in the U.S. We said, Sue each other, figure it out, and then call back. You know? <laughs> Because we've always uh, taken care of that to get, but until I was at the Library of Congress with Horatio and met the head of the Library of Congress, I said, "Look, I keep getting sued because you guys are such. You just don't have this done right. Today with a computer, I need you to be able to type in a few words and you tell us if it's somebody else's words." Yeah, yeah. And he said, "Oh, I never thought of that. Okay, good. Anyhow, proper estate plan ensures that you're going to have safety of earnings, like I said, with the Wizard of Oz on into the future. If you're going to co-write, like I." Boy, if you're going to beat the marketplace, it seems to me a lot of partnerships are a good idea. But make sure your lawyer, your lawyer draws it up with the four Ds. Divorce, disability, dissolution, or death. Right? So you've got it covered. Because one of those four things is guaranteed to happen with your partner. It's just in. What am I doing now? That's what we're going to come back to talk to. You're going to do a couple closing things, and then we're going to go to break. Okay, you. Welcome back up, Cynthia, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody, um, as Mark's going through this, are you generating any questions? 
Yeah. Okay. What I want you to do, if you have a burning question, and we won't be able to get to all of them, but write it down on a, a sheet of paper, and then forward it to the center aisle, and we'll pick them up. And after, we'll start with some questions and try to end with some questions, too, okay? Um, also, we have vendors in the back of the room who really are here to support you. So I'm going to read about uh, three of them between each break so you can kind of get an idea of who's here. Mary Jo Zazvita. She's with To The Point Solutions. Mary Jo offers editing, text design, and complete book packaging to authors and self-publishers. So stop by her booth. Dr. Bruce Tracy provides indexing services for your publications as well as ghostwriting, which is certainly an avenue to pursue as well. So uh, go back and say hi to Dr. Bruce Terry. And then uh, finally, Marty Chenard, president of Advanced Marketing Strategies a strategic marketing company that's generated $2 billion in sales in the last 15 years. Since that you handed in, we have collated and we put them in order. We're going to have Cynthia ask the question. I'm going to answer it in bullet form because we've still got a lot more copy and I've got about 12 more people I want to introduce you to all in this hour. Okay. Mark, what is the best and quickest way to get permissions to use quotes? And can you tell us if you know what the law is? Yeah, the, the law is now, thanks to software, so you've got to get permissions on everything. And you need to have an attorney write up a permissionable thing or just go to uh, your uh, legal counsel at any one of the law schools. Like here, we got about a law school every other block, it seems. And let one of those lawyers write up a permissionable thing for you. If you need a permission, like somebody asked about John Kennedy's quote, uh, you write his estate at uh, in Boston or Cambridge, and you'll get it. No sweat. Okay, great. Um, if self-publishing, how do you generate the capital to have the amount of books in print to sell 20,000 copies in a week? Okay, we've got uh, Dan Pointer in the back, and, and Dan's going to tell you how to do that. But self-publishing is so good, and we get some people in the audience that are going to talk tomorrow about POD, print on demand. Today you can print as little as 1 to 10 or 20 books on print on demand. It's a brand new technology from Xerox, and you can start, and then you just sell your way forward, and you take orders, and then you print the books. It's a great idea. That's a great, so start small. The idea start small, is, yeah. Right. Don't, don't load your garage or, or your bedroom with books. That's not the goal. Right, okay, good. This is a very important question. You were talking about uh, you, in 18 months you sold a million and a half books. What specifically did your activities look like on a daily basis? We asked everybody to buy books, and, and when we started, we had the 20,000 people. We sent them back a letter. Then we started calling our friends, and we started by asking every friend to buy 100 books. Like in the next section, I'm going to show you how to ask to buy, have people buy 100 books. Raymond Aaron, whose assistants are in the room, um, who did Chicken Soup of the Canadian Soul with us, he used to have the Millionaire's Club up in Canada. He called me and said, I'll buy 1,600 books rather than 100 if you'll sign every one. And he faxed me down a list, and I signed every one of them. Jack signed every one of them. Then we started asking people to buy 1,000 books. You know, if you don't ask, you're not going to get the order. And the answer was no before you asked. So we did outrageous, crazy stuff like that. So you're on the phone. You're calling people, asking them to buy books. Everybody. What else? Were you, what, what else? Like if I called you and asked you to buy 100 books, would you buy 100 I, books? I already have. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. See how easy that was? Are you kidding? Of course. Um, and then what about what kind of support did you have? Did you have a publicist when your book first came out? When our book first came out, uh, we did not have a publicist. We were publicizing ourselves and just begging every little public. Publication and the quickest way, Roseanne, where are you, my dear? Come up here quick and bring those newspaper articles. She'll show that. We'll go back to that question when she gets here. Okay. So what kind of back-end support did you have in the very beginning? You did not have a publicist. So how, how we, did you do all of this? We just did it, just like my dear friend Roseanne from uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, is coming up here. And we so got we, a handheld did you call the people too. yourself? Here. Did you call the magazine Yeah, I called yourself? the magazine okay, myself and yourself. tried to do it. Introduce yourself so everyone knows who you are. Um, Roseanne Higgins, Phoenix, Arizona. Is this hot? Is this hot? Okay, good. Well, what do you want me to... Do, tell address? them what you did with these great articles. Okay. I'll hold this for you if you want. Um, I have a company called Spies, and I'm a romance headhunter. And everywhere I go, I tell people. And my job for a living is attending events and finding people to date my clients. The difference between what I do in a dating service is only one person has to be a client. So I'm always looking for pretty girls to date my guys and really awesome guys to date the girls that have hired me. Well, newspaper reporters find this fascinating. They want to do stories on me. So I always have information about what I do in my bag. I have had press releases at the Arizona Innovation Network Award, so the Arizona Republic did a story right there just in a column. I got new clients from that. Well, last Thursday, I got a story. I'm a little nervous. It's okay, okay. <laughs> Keep support on her, everybody. Um, 
last Thursday, I got this story because the Arizona Republic website interviewed me on dating tips for Valentine's Day. Well, while I was in, this, in the building, there's this guy who does relationship stories. I keep my eyes open for who covers my topic. Doug Carroll writes relationship stories. So I just called to introduce myself while I was in the building and say hello. And I said, by the way, I've been in business eight years. This is what I do for a living. This is my phone number. If I can ever help you with anything, I know you write on relationships, and I've been following you over the years, and I like your articles. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, let me unwrap that. When, when she asked what we did, Jack and I went to every desk at the L.A. Times and said, will you do a story on us? Now, 99% of them said no, but one of them said yes. Mm -hmm. She's doing the same butt-breaking behavior. And right. were you nervous and scared? No. Wait, that's not what this article says. Wait a second, I read it. In it the says, where you wrote that? It says, to be outgoing enough to approach people takes guts. Sometimes I'm scared and nervous, but what's the worst thing that could happen? Next. But look at she got the cover story. Is that good or is that good? That's that is. Right. And then he said about getting on magazine covers. I bring this just to add credibility to who I am. So this this magazine did a cover story. This magazine did a cover story. They chose that outfit. This one I chose because if you're walking by the rack, I want you to pick this up even if you don't like what I do because you like the outfit. It'll catch your eye. If I'm more, if I'm doing a TV interview, I wear something. If you're flipping channels, then maybe you'll act, actually like the outfit. Um, let me see. Oh. Um, I write stories like if somebody asks me to write something for them, I want something that's useful that they'll, ha that they'll keep. I offered to write for a publication for free. I wrote one article for a year called uh, How to Work a Room. And uh, all I asked for was a byline. Please put that I'm, I have this company called SPIES, that it stands for Single Professional Introductions for the Especially Selective, that I'm a romance headhunter, and this is my phone number and my email address. And I, I interviewed, I used that as a, a way to meet even more people, like Jerry Colangelo, who is the managing partner of the Arizona Di Diamondbacks. And then I had drinks. <laughs> Yay, Diamondbacks! Um, and then... Um, uh, David Brashears and I had a drink. If they're a guest speaker, I try to have I try to have lunch with them. Mark Victor Hansen and I are friends because I interviewed Mark and Chrissy Donnelly from Chicken Soup for the Couple Couple Soul, and he gave me a picture, and Mark and Chrissy gave me a picture, and uh, because of this, this is a newsletter I created. Because of this, the, when Phoenix Magazine did a story about spies, the editor saw this and called me up and said, "We'd like you to write for Phoenix Magazine." I'm like. Who is this? <laughs> and I'm like, really? Because usually people call and beg for those kind of jobs. And she says, really, we'd like you to keep your ear to the ground on what's cool and happening in Arizona, and we'd like you to write for us. So I've interviewed people like Esteban. If you don't know Esteban, he sold the most. Let me see. He made the billboard charts on Home Shopping Network. Cool. So anyway... I don't know what else to say. Oh, we wrote a chapter in this. Because I met Debbie Allen. A lot of people may know her. She was former president of the National Speakers Association Arizona chapter. And it's called, did I say it? Confessions no. of Shameless Self-Promoters. And my chapter is called A Niche in a Network. I'm not in the glossary or the index, but I'm on page 120. Um, <laughs> um, um, but I, I do things like buy things at silent auctions to meet the people that I want to meet. Like in New York City. I was just and I'm going to book Expo America, thanks, thanks to you guys telling me when it is. And I bought lunch with Bill Ritter at a silent auction there and Bill is the nighttime news anchor on Channel 7 and he also knows Barbara Walters and they said we might see her. Well Barbara when I was in New York told me during intermission on The View which producer to send my proposal for being on The View to. So I mean this is what I think about but I didn't start writing my book until I got in here and I'm back at the room ferociously writing like crazy because I had to get off my ass and the only way I could do that is by coming to the seminar about book marketing because you're going to market something you have to have the book. <laughs> Give her a round of applause. Thank you, thank you. One more thing. I forgot to also tell you, Cynthia Kersey is unstoppable. I've seen her. We met at a conference, at the Governor's Conference for Women in Long Beach years ago. And we, you know how you just bond with somebody instantly? I think this whole room can bond with Cynthia. I think a gnat could bond with Cynthia. <laughs> thank you, Roseanne. Thank you. Thanks, Roseanne. Great job. Roseanne is a wonderful marketer. She really is. Okay. So as far as your daily activities, do you sleep? Yes, of course. That's basically it. So what is your, do you start at what time and what time do you end? I start and I exercise because I like to wake up my metabolic system and then, um, depends. If we got media at 3 o'clock in the morning, that's what we do. When Jack and I were just in New York, that's what we were doing at 3 o'clock in the morning because we had to be on Fox Band, uh, family network and then just go blast through the day and it moves pretty quick you can't waste any time if you're wasting time you're wasting your future just you know when you work work and get it done fast and the first year and a half were you on the road all the time or 
When I was on the road, we asked every client, and we also asked all the customers to buy a book for every one of their people, and a lot of them did it. And some of the companies, uh, you know, or franchises like Remax, and we got to blow it all the way through. Dr. Tom Hill, where are you in here? Tom, stand up. Uh, he owns an $8 million little franchise for Remax, and, and uh, they had a Remax leaders meeting, and he bought them for everybody, and now he's doing chicken soup in the entrepreneurial soul with us. Isn't that the way it happened? Good. Give him a round of applause, if you would please. What do you think is the most important? If somebody could just afford one person for additional help, what kind of role would that fill? In, in, in sales, we always say you want to get an assistant that you can delegate everything to that makes your life effortless so you don't have to look at it. Like Trudy is mine, and I only get a red file, and you know, because we get a lot of mail, it gets uh, winnowed down to two or three pieces so I can go through it and I get it synchronized down to the emails. You know, and, and you gotta, if you're going to become famous, you've got to have your own private email that is a pseudonym that no one could ever figure out. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, if you're looking to get a, a contract with a publisher, what do you think are the most important points to cover? Be like and sell the publisher on you as a person and make sure that he or she is going to go the long distance. And then um, to piggyback that too, self-publishing versus publishing, why did you self-publish? I mean, why did you publish versus Well, we self-published self originally and if we couldn't get somebody, to, we, what we needed was distribution. That's the key and we got Dan Pointer is going to talk brilliantly about that so I'm not going to mm -hmm. touch that right now. So what do you recommend? By the way, if, 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 what so many of you said have done, William, where's uh, Steve Shapiro? Come here quick. Run up here as fast as you can, Steve. Is it, at the front end, it's not a bad idea to, to uh, self-publish and, and I think that's what Steve is going to tell us right now. So he sold, how many books did you sell? Uh, 190,000. In a title? Uh, listening for success was one and the other one was the art of professional serving and I sold that many because of one simple thing that I learned from Mark what was that find a niche to get rich and what was your niche the first one I wrote a book for waiters believe it or not there are over a million waiters in America no one had ever written a book for them so I did it I sold almost 90,000 Cool, and cool, the cool. second one, thanks. The second one is called Listening for Success. This is a topic, this book applies to all six and a half billion people on the planet. But if I wrote it for all six and a half billion of them, I learned from Mark, I couldn't have sold it to hardly any of them. So I had to write it to a, a niche. And, and you look for, I look for a, a tightly targeted niche with a wide audience. So I wrote this book for network marketing industry, about 2 million people in that industry that I could have sold it to. And I've sold 110,000 to that industry. Three times I got orders for 20,000 books. Mm -hmm. Give him a round of applause, please. Thank you. Now that's a market that you're pretty good in. Yeah, we oh, right. I am network marketing. Love that audience. Um, also, one thing about book um, contracts that I think I got the best of both worlds is I got the non-exclusive rights to sell everywhere, which is really important. And then secondly, oh, wait, let, it, let me unwrap that. What it means is that your publisher is going to want to have all the rights to sell in bookstores, which you give them that. But you want to have the rights to sell everywhere else, like I talked about last night. And go ahead. What does and that mean to you? Other, well, what? it's huge because that's really where you make your money. It's not so much in the bookstores, but it's everywhere else. And one piece of um, advice is to get an audio program. I didn't really start doing really well financially until I had a $100 product that I could sell, and I made a huge difference. I made What's about a half title? a million dollars. Um, un your Unstoppable Journey. So I, what I did is I took the book and broke it down into 30, 15-minute sessions. So every day it's one principle, one story, and one action. And I found that my audiences, you know, you can read a book, but you need it over and over because the problem is, you're going to leave this room of unstoppability and go back into the world where the stoppable people live, right? The heathens and non-believers. <laughs> Anybody have any heathens and non-believers in your life? And so we have to have information that will inspire us, and that really is the power of the audio program, and I think that's why I'm doing so well with it, and I'm on Home Shopping Network next month. Thanks to my wonderful agent. Kimberly, are you here? I have the most amazing agent. You should talk to her about getting on Home Shopping Network yourself. But I'm going to be selling that along with my book. So you have to have an audio program. It's really important. Three more questions. Please. Okay. Can I finish one more thing about the, the royalty? Because this is key. I got to close on my book to buy my book back at cost of printing plus a percentage. So I even buy my books less than Mark does. 
Now, of course, you, I if the publisher knows what they're doing, they want you right. to feed the market. They want you to seed the market. Mm -hmm. Like when Wyland is, we launched Chicken Soup, the Ocean Lover still this fall, he's going on a tour with uh, Sean Custo, Jock's youngest kid who is totally into saving the oceans. We're going to clean up the oceans. He's giving away a million, and the people are going to buy, give $100 to half a go to Wyland's foundation to educate every kid to the ocean and the environment, and the other half goes to Jock Custo's foundation, and they get a T-shirt, and they're going to get one of our books. But we seed the marketplace with a million books. If the publisher is smart and savvy, which most of them are, mm -hmm. you should be able to buy those books at cost. Any of the books that go to charity or the most cost plus 10. Most of them want to give you 50 off, right. which is, means they've got Tinker Toys for brains. Exactly. What so saying. very, very important. Um, what By the way, I'm a little caustic, and I don't mean, it just, and not all publishers are that way. It just most of them don't get the deal that you and I are making it happen. They are printing it. They're distributing it. Not that they're not working hard and you should enroll them and, and mm -hmm. have them be part of your team, but most of them just don't quite get it. Right. They see it as competition. Yeah. Instead of one person who buys your book, they'll tell five other people about Which it. Which is the basic concept you've got to get. There's no competition. What is there? No competition. It's all in your mind. Oh, well, if she sells more, I'll sell less. Oh, bunk. We help each other so much. She's just getting me on a cover of a magazine called Excellence, which isn't that the produced magazine? Mm -hmm. It's a magazine with a quality of architectural digest and a Rob report, and it's just wonderful. Good. Um, what about distribution? If you're self-publishing, how do you do that? How do you get distribution into the bookstores? It's a good question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You start with the little local bookstores. Like when we, I was in Newport, you know, I went down to Martha's bookstore on Balboa Island, and I, you know, loved them, and they loved me, and we just got all the books signed, and they made it start to go, and then they bounced me because everybody in the bookstore knows. So it's very slow, but it's like it's like when you do PBS, you got to do it's called bicycling. You got to mm -hmm. go from station to station. You do it in a local station, like when my PBS show came out in 1984, and we're doing a new one now. But um, you know, I was going on after Leo Biscay, and I thought, oh my God, here I'm going to make it. And what did Cynthia say? One thing isn't it it's the media mix it's the marketing mix it's the it takes a ton of stuff that's why you heard Marcy say you got to do multiple things you can't do one thing and go well whew, man I'm done and now it's going to float forever no it's like Zig's thing about priming the pump you put the water in you pump and then if you stop pumping it goes back down you got to just keep pumping but it gets easier because you get into high flight and you've trim tabbed it perfect and Dan Foyer's going to talk a whole lot about that in much more detail one last question one last question what did the partnership with Golf Digest look like oh boy that's a good question uh, Golf Digest, as you know, is the most read rag. It's called in a magazine. It's called rag, which is a de deprecating term, but. Um what they did is they put us on the cover. They helped us get stories. Uh, they all pictured us. We put uh, what's called a blow-in in every one of our books, which means that, it, it, the, you know, when you read a magazine and the, and the um, little thing falls out, that's what's called a blow-in. And a blow-in helps you get your uh, book sold, in, and it's been a perfect marriage. We went to talk at their meetings free. They came and did our stuff free. Uh, we got, uh, they own stuff like, as I understand it, Bootlegger, which is the one. So we're sold at every golf course. Here's the deal. The people that play golf at the expense of clubs owned by Bob Dud Dedman, who's a Horatio guy, Club Corps of America, the only billionaire in golf, right? Those are the places you want to sell because what happens is that if Cynthia's a golfer, and I expect she is, right, she's got everything. She, and if she's a man, like Charlie, you got all those weird pants that you can't wear anywhere except on the golf course, right? And those weird shirts that, you know, you look like you should be walking down Venice Beach. You know, you, all you need is pink rollers and you got it wired. And, the, you know, the, the point is, is that. What do they sell? All of a sudden, our book came out and it became the hottest thing sold. Now we're coming out in next month with Chicken Soup for the Golf, Dig uh, Golf 2, and uh, Golf Digest is our partner again. And we're doing, you do as many benefactions back and forth as you can, and you try to how to figure out how to do them so they're seamless and they're costless. They're intangible and weightless, but they give mega benefit to the readers of Golf Digest and vice versa to us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And there's a lot of stuff. Thank okay, you. All right. You. We're ready to rock again. What are we doing now? Well, first, sell the book first. When do you sell the book? First, I'm sorry, that T is burnt off there somehow. So, wherever the projector is, can we get it moved back? Thank you. And it, then write it. We sold One Minute Millionaire before we wrote it, and I'm going to take you through how that. Always start at the end. Where do you start at the And I'm going to show you some articles that prove how that works. It, it works with media. It works with everything. Start at the end. What does that mean? It means you've got to go into the, your innermost, higher-most self. Close your outer eyes. Tilt your inner eyes up at a 45. Listen to a little Pachelbel Cannon and D, and go to the end result. What would it outpicture like if it were perfect? What would it look like? So what De uh, Deborah Jones always teaches is that you've got the mental equivalent, so you've got it working in a uh, perfect way. So 
Bob came to one of my parties. Now, I said I was going to show you the fun aspects of this. Every year, my wife and I get remarried, and we have a couple hundred people come, and we pay for the party, and I write my own marital vows, because most people get married for better or... Now, that's dumb and dumber. If you get what you affirm, why would you do that? Right? Richer or poor. Why not get richer and richer? And and because and I live here in L.A., I always thought, heck, somebody ought to invite me to a Hollywood party, and nobody ever did. So I said, well, if nobody's going to invite me, I'll have my own. So I met Doris Jackson of the Shirelles, coming to the chapel, and you're going to get married, and dedicated to the one I love. We hired her and paid her to come to our party and invited everyone to the ceremony. And Bob and his wife, Daryl, came, and, and uh, he came up and said, that book, I, I said, I'm ready to write the forward. I really want to write the forward to One Minute Millionaire because I want to know how to do it because you've done it so many times, 200 times. I thought, hell, I should learn this. I want to mentor to you. He goes up to Trudy and says, where's the farthest marks flying away? Oh, I've got to do one other thing about the party. So Doris figures a perfect gift to us. She comes to the party, and she brings Richard Street and the Temptations as her gifts, gift to, to the... I get goosebumps. Tell you, I mean, you go... Oh, way cool, right? Because you're supposed to have your life get better and better. The Bible says you're supposed to go from glory to glory. Not me, man. I like to drag my measly ass around and have a lousy time. <laughs> what? You're here to have fun. What are you here to have? Everyone say, I'm here to have fun. So, Bob shows up on a flight. We're flying up to Vancouver. And I said, man, I got this confixatory contract with HCI. They don't let me write anything outside of books. So I said, but we'll write a movie. So, we sat on the plane. We wrote this movie. But if you're going to start, you start at the end. Where do you start at the end? And Titanic was just out, and we knew how many they had. So, we said, what we're going to start with is, how do you fill 10 million butts in seats? Because no one's ever done that. Is Scott uh, here yet? Okay, we got a guy that's still coming that I want to introduce you to. So we went to New York to sell it, and everybody turned us down except one company, Random House, and Jillian Manis, who's going to talk to you, is this beautiful blonde in the center. We, I'd just been to a wedding. Ariel Ford had got married, and she had Kenny Loggins sing her wedding up in Santa Barbara, and under every chair was a tetrahedron, and after they got married, we lifted the tetrahedrons, we opened them, and 400 butterflies flew into heaven. It's like when Ricky and uh, Michael got married, they released 400 white doves outside. Just, just cool stuff. So I, thought, I saw that and I said, Ariel, where do you get these butterflies? We want to do that. We released butterflies in every audience, man. In New York, I mean, at, at uh, Time Warner, they're diving under the table at Bantam. They're, like, they've never seen a butterfly in this concrete jungle. <laughs> But this is a lady, that was a, this lovely lady of blue is Becky Carbaza, who bought our book, and she's holding the little butterfly, and she's, just, she's enchanted, and that's uh, the team that uh, we did. There's what the book sort of looks like. It's going to have a little morphing of the cover. And should you do the cover yourself and bring it to the publisher and go like this? Should you muscle test? We've got a lot of people in here. Any of the chiropractors know AK, Applied Kinesiology. Muscle test your name, the font, the color. Do, do it in different parts because your body, your inner body, Body language can't lie. Just like when you're saying, do I need this herb? Do I need one a day, two a day? All that kind of stuff. People can teach you that. Dr. Shivana King can teach you if you need to know. The point is, what was our vision? We wanted to do stuff that's never been done before. So, by the way, this is about to expand you. Everyone say, I'm ready. Some of you, it's going to shock you because you're going to go, how do these guys think so big? Well, we said we wanted to pre-sell, pre-sell a million books. Out on the left, we've got out there uh, Chris and Janet Atwood who... We're with Reading is Fun that sold a lot of my books. Reading is Fundamental is out of Fairfield, Iowa. They used to go in, in uh, schools. And how many of you are teachers in here? If, you, if you're a teacher, are you still teaching? Okay, but up until last year, Reading is Fun had come in and they'd say, oh, here's a chicken soup book, chicken soup of the mother sold. Take it home, read it overnight if you like it, buy it. And, you know, they're selling a lot. They just sold that company for $380 million to Reader's Digest. Now, Reader's Digest, by the way, is the biggest direct mail company. They sell a billion dollars worth of books a year by direct mail. The second biggest is Rodale Press. Rodale Press starts at the end. They start at the end. They write the ad, test it on the market, then they have somebody write the book. Duh. <laughs> Remember, sell it first. If the market isn't going to buy it. Now, if you write, if you sell something, you must, by law, deliver it in six weeks or you get to go to jail. So you better have a good ghost if you're not a good writer. You know? 
Anyhow, we're pre-selling a million books out there. We're finding 100 people in 100 cities. 100 times 100 is 10,000. Buy 100 books each. That's a million books. And we're well on our way. If any of you would like to invest in 100 books, we also give you our millionaire training by telephone and in three uh, seminars during the next year just because we want to do it. We're going to sell 10 million books post-publication. Why? My goal is to create a million millionaires that all create a million dollars for charity. And we're testing the charity. We're testing their giving, not their receiving. Because we've got a postulate, and Marshall Thurber has worked it out, so we're going to test how much people give. What does that mean? That means, remember, find the niche. What's the worry list? If you're a priest, minister, or rabbi, or guru, your trouble is getting people to give you money. So we're going to give it free, some parts of it, to every minister. If you're a minister, I come to you and I say, how would you like to know who's tithing, who's not? How would you like to get the tithers to tithe more and the ones that aren't giving to give? What are they going to say? Duh! We just figured out how to do that. Can't tell you the rest, but we're going to sell millions of books that way because it's so quick. Let me, let me go into that one step deeper. This thing is, I don't care where you give, I care that you give. There are a lot of legitimate 501c3, so that's the non-issue. But let me give you the example. I told you about Horatio Algier. I'm going to introduce you to one of our recipients in just a few minutes after I unwrap this. You all know Christopher Reeves is a great athlete, was out riding on his horse. He's a prize-winning um, equestrian, and his hands got wrapped in the reins. And a horse, horses are not the smartest animals. Both my daughters are riders. My little daughters are equestrian, hopeful for the Olympic, if Dad can afford the kind of horses they want. Anyhow, they once in a while stop. Well, his horse stopped. He went over and he crushed his C1 down. He's in the hospital, and the doctor say, look, pal, you're, you're dust. His wife, Dana, said, honey, I believe in hospice. I'll just hold your hand if you want to die now. It'll be okay, and I'll let you go, because they say you're not ever going to walk again or be able to be anything but a quadriplegic, and your acting career, as we've known it, is over. His five-year-old comes and crawls up in his now decrepit body, kisses him on both cheeks, and says, Daddy, you can't go. I love you, and I need you. Chris calls over the doctor, who's a close friend of mine. And says, what will it take to regenerate the spine? He goes and finds out. that He says, you give me $50 million, in four years I'll regenerate your spine. Chris says, Dana, call Robin. Now his roommate at Juilliard was Robin Williams, my favorite actor. Patty and I just went and saw him here at Universal Studio two nights ago. This guy is a genius. He's whacked, but he's a genius. <laughs> he says, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing near you. <laughs> He and his teacher, who Jonathan Winters, are both whacked. Anyhow, but I love him. He says, I need $50 million. In two weeks, he went on a telethon and raised $50 million and gave it to this doctor who I unfortunately am no longer allowed to give his name because too many of you called him. But he's a member at Horatio, and when we sat together not long ago, he said, Mark, the breakthrough of breakthroughs. This is the guy who created micro neurosurgery. His best student is the one who created intravenous technology only 16 years ago. I mean, this is a major player. He said, we just grew the first four cells of C1. We'll have this boy up and walk in the next four years. 38 million people that are incarcerated in wheelchairs, if they choose to, will all be ambulatory again. That's what I'm saying, is that every one of you has got an issue. When I'm teaching the giving seminars, I say, look, if you're in an elevator with Bill Gates for 15 seconds, and anything you say you want, he'll grant your wish. Because, I mean, the guy's worth essentially $100 billion dollars. And we've had audiences write everything. Everybody in the audience will support it. And then we have people come up and put their hand on that person. And it just, it's amazing how fast it'll work. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have 10 million people read it. We're going to create a million millionaires. No one's ever had the guts to do that. And Marshall says we're going to change the economic history of the world and we'll get a Nobel Prize. I don't know about that, but I, I thought it was interesting when he said it. Create a series of best-selling books. Because you don't want to do one, you want to do many. And like I'm talking to all the kids now. About, let me do that. Steffi, come up here. Stephanie is, a, is one of the recipients of the Horatio Alger Award, and I wanted to tell your story, her story just because I want to make sure every kid doesn't go out and get a job. What Marshall and Bob and I are going to do is work with the fastest growing uh, entrepreneurial university, Northwoods University, because we want to make sure the kids don't all get a job, but some of them create empires, because every millionaire creates 10 new jobs. 
So if we're going to create a million new millionaires, there's 10 million jobs. And we're going to create 400 billionaires. We're going to help guys like famous Dave who said, yeah, I'll go for a B. And we've got Monty in here who I'm going to introduce in a minute. I'll go for the B. And, Mar- and w- Wyland's going to go for the B. So we're going to create some, every billionaire creates 10,000 jobs. So we're going to end unemployment. Because the only way you end poverty is by creating employment. What I'm saying is you've got to think at levels nobody's ever thought before. Introduce yourself, Steffi. My name is Stephanie Kobus. I grew up in a small town, Iowa, Alton, Iowa, about 60 miles north of Sioux City. Um, I grew up in a household. I'm an only child. Um, my father was manic depressive and schizophrenic all of his life. And I led a halfway normal life, um, just tried to cover it up until my sophomore year in high school. And my mom got really sick. Um, She came down with what we all thought was the flu, but we took her into the hospital. I had to take her in by myself, um, basically because my dad couldn't handle it. He didn't like large crowds um, because of his mental problems and stuff. So I took her in by myself, um, took a day off of school to do it. We found out that she had suffered from a brain aneurysm. Um, From there, we went to Sioux City, and this was on... Um, Holy Thursday. On Good Friday, she was airlifted to Sioux Falls. Um, So Holy Saturday night we spent in Sioux Falls, my entire family and friends. Um, And then we were rushed back to Sioux City where she died on Easter Sunday. Um, She was my best friend in the entire world. And she gave me the courage to do and be where I am today. And she's still with me. I know she is. Um, I was 16 at that time. I had to take care of my father now, go to high school, um, what was my, your grade point? My grade point average at that point in time was a 4.0. By the way, <laughs> a ratio is helping every at-risk kid like her. There's not one that we've ever turned down. What we're at risk of in America is losing the potential of the greatest kids in the world. Go ahead, Steph. Um, continuing on, um, I took care of my father um, as best I could. Friends and family really didn't know about my father's problem. Um, There was a family feud between my dad and my mother's side of the family. It had been going on for 10 years. Um, He got into a fist fight with one of my uncles and was sent to the uh, mental hospital. And so they hadn't talked in 10 years. So that was quite hard. Um, I planned my mom's funeral uh, by myself. Um, I was supposed to go to California to LA that summer on a dance trip and spent most of my money on my mom's funeral. Um, we are not, <laughs> I'm not, we were not economically rich in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I gave what I could to that. Um, family helped, my mom's side helped with her funeral quite a bit. Um, but friends and family were always there. My class was amazing. Um, they helped me get where I am today, and that's how I got the Horatio Alger Award was because of them. Without their encouragement and without their support, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, About six weeks later, (laughs) um, they told me to get out of the house. Uh, I went to see a counselor. They said I was getting pretty sick, and they said I couldn't, like, stay up, work, um, do my homework, and take care of my father all at the same time. So they had me get out of the house and go to an aunt and uncle's and live with them for a little bit, um, leaving my dad by himself, which was really hard because they, both sides didn't get along. So um, my dad was mad at me that I was staying with this aunt and uncle. My aunt and uncle were like, no, you have to stay here. So that was quite difficult. Um, he would call frequently. I went to a small high school. My graduating class had 23 in it. Um, there was only 100 in my entire high school. All were really supportive. Um, so he would call frequently throughout the day, making sure I was at school. My secret- The school secretary was like, you can't um, have your dad call here anymore. And I really couldn't help that. But um, they eventually didn't start returning the calls. Um, one day in geometry class, school and dancing were my escape. And so I went back as soon as I could. Um, one day during my geometry class, I was called down to the office. And I kind of knew something was up, but I didn't know what. And so I went down to the office after school, and a teacher met me and wouldn't let me even get to the office. She brought me over to the priest household where I sat, walked in, um, and some of my family was in there. My counselor was in there. And then a guy that worked at the ambulance for the ambulance stood up, and I knew immediately what happened. My dad had committed suicide. So I had just turned 17. Um, This was three days after my 17th birthday, and he had just committed suicide. 
So once again, <laughs> I went back to my aunt and uncle's where food and and friends and family were always all there for me. Um, the community out poured to me. The church community poured to me. Um, and so I've been on my own essentially since that time, since the age of 17. Um, I live with an aunt and uncle now. The money issue now was the fact that um, my dad's side it wasn't very close at all with him, and so he didn't, they didn't help with the funeral at all. So I took what I had left and gave to the funeral and once again buried my father and had no money to get to L.A. Um, for my dancing trip. But friends, family, um, the community, the church community, they all supported me. They were all really, really great people, and I got to go to L.A. with um, money left over to spend that year. And so... Um, it came to my senior year, and the Horatio Alger Award came up. And I wasn't going to apply. Friends and family told me, you know, just try it. You know, you'll, you never know my, what might happen. And so I applied for the Horatio Alger Award. Um, apparently, when I was in Washington, D.C. on the scholarship trip last year, 50,000 people, students at risk like me, apply each year, and only 104 of those people get the scholarship. Um, I was one chosen to go. I was one of two from the state of Iowa that got to go and represent um, and receive this award. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. And I met Mark Victor Hansen. Um, my mom was very religious, very um, into the inspirational stuff. And she always told me to pray. And one of her famous things was always, where God shuts a door, somewhere he opens a window. And the window of opportunity that I have found is through other people's hearts. People have just outpoured to me all the time. And I went to Washington, D.C., and I introduced myself to Mark Victor Hansen. And chicken soup books were my mom and I, for my mom and I, that was our escape. That's how we kept going day to day. That's how we lived on. And I went up to him, and I introduced myself, and I said, you know, we buried my mom with chicken soup for the mother's soul and chicken soup for the couple's soul so that she can read chicken soup in heaven because that's how much she meant to me, and that's how much chicken soup for the soul books meant to us. So thank you, Mark, for bringing me out here. Thank you, Mark, Victor Hansen's staff, for bringing me out here. It's been an amazing experience. Thank you all. Tell them what you're going to do. <laughs> Currently, um, I'm 19 years old. I attend Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. I'm a freshman there. Um, I'm majoring in journalism with a minor in English. And I hope someday to be in New York City or some other big place um, writing for a major newspaper, writing my autobiography on the side. Um, that was another thing. Since about the age, since fourth grade, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, and my mom always said that we were going to write a book together, and it was going to be called Living with a Schizophrenic because my dad never attended, like, any of my sport, sporting events or anything. Um, frequently, our, like, vacations were shortened because we had to go home right away. Um, but now I've, I spoke at two local high schools back home um, sharing my story, and I would really, really love to be an inspirational speaker going out and telling my story. If I can inspire others the way that people have inspired me, that would just be the ultimate. So I want to write a book, be a top reporter, be a teacher, be a, everything that I can be. I want to do a lot of things. <laughs> Give a round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I just didn't want any of you to miss, you know, because I keep talking about Horatio, and you say, well, why do you like this? There's not a, a, kid, a student that isn't like her. I mean, oh, man, they have such horror stories that, uh, you know, mostly their fam families are mangled or, or dilapidated or wrecked or ruined or, oh, gosh, such abuse you can't believe. But every one of these kids comes through as a shining, resilient example. And this year, every Horatio guy has been, and lady has been asked to uh, raise a million dollars in a brand new way, which that's one of the reasons I thought, gosh, this will work with One Minute Millionaire, and what we're going to do is make sure that they get it because you'd have to be a stone <laughs> and not be moved by her. Okay. Blockbuster movie, and uh, then we want to create a million millionaires, and then we want to create billions for charity. Actually, what we want to do is create a trillion for charity, and no one's ever done that before, so we thought we'd do that. That's our vision. <laughs> Remember, we said start at the end. Where do you start at the end? 
So Publishers Weekly is the rag that is read by everybody in the industry. So we said One Minute Millionaire makes publishing history. What first time a single book could be fiction, nonfiction? Number one, on both sides is the bestseller list because half the book's fiction. This side will be in yellow, and there's a butterfly to start every paragraph. The left side is the millionaire minutes and the millionaire ahas that tell you exactly how to do it and what to do and how to get there. And see, so notice we write all this stuff. This is where you start. You start with marketing. Where do you start with? You don't start by writing the book. You write the marketing plan first. And we said a major new blockbuster, number one New York Times bestseller, Mark and Bob, you know, did it. We sold it on September 18th, 2002. Great things happen with great goals. We said, look, we're going to have the millionaire, minute, One Minute Millionaire be the first book, New York Times, simultaneously fiction, nonfiction. One Minute Millionaire prepaid orders a million hardcovers before pub date, and we're going to do a POD. And we're going to, we had ten different ways to sell a million books that no one's ever done. We're hoping to do Occam's Razor. When we had that meeting, which I asked you to take home those tapes, Brian Tracy said, look, Occam's Razor is you do it the easiest, fastest way. Find one person to sell a million books to. And Bob and I are sitting next to each other and go, <laughs> our boy Brian has lost it. My best student in insurance is Jimmy Griffin. I own 5% of the fast-growing insurance company. We do uh, buy all kinds of cool insurance that are going to change the world. But Jimmy says... My best friend is Sandy Weil, and he runs a little company called uh, Travelers, and, and uh, they could buy a million books and just give it out to all their best clients at Visa and all that, and thought, way cool, and that's, that order's in process. So you can do stuff, but you've got to be hanging around people that are going to push the edge of your envelope to do stuff that's never been done. Millionaire sells 10 million books first 36 months. One minute millionaire raised uh, 10 million for related charities and causes. Then our 28 page marketing plan, which is in, in that set of tapes, all the stuff that you could do. They, the head of Bantam said, I can't believe it. You, why do you guys need us? I said, because we've got to have a team. You've got to do stuff that no one's ever done. So here's the 40 top marketing experts that we brought out that no one ever did. And you see some of my team there. And then we had the, like the who's who of the planet there, the guy who created Pep Boys and all that. Just, you know, friends, the guy who created Dietrich's Coffee. So you've you got to have some different points of view. One more time. Take your two index fingers, put them together, and say one and one equals. So you get your team together. You get your dream together. The question we asked is if your loved one's life depended on it, what would you do? Just like what you heard Stephanie say. She didn't want to bury her parents. She didn't want to do the funeral. She didn't want to raise that. She had to grow up way too fast. But you and I are incapable of incredible stuff. Most of us are vastly underused. The word sin in Aramaic means to miss the mark, to miss the target. You only miss the target if you don't have one. If you don't have a purpose, your purpose is to get a purpose. Cynthia said you've got to have a purpose, a cause, a reason for living bigger than you. If you don't have a goal, your goal is to set some goals and have some goals that have some biceps and triceps, some temerity, some gut. So here's Bob and I teaching in front of the team saying here's all the cool stuff that we're going to do. Remember, we teach multiple streams or multiple sources of income. We're teaching multiple streams of marketing. We said we'll do it on the Internet. We'll do a major tour. We'll do high-profile endorsements. We'll do word of mouth. In a book business, it's called hand-along marketing, but you've got to get everybody to hand it along. Got to make sure you build your million dollar Rolodex. Make sure you befriend people because the people on the way up, the cliche is you meet on the way down. But you also meet them going sideways. And you ought to be real, real nice to everyone you meet all the time. Stedman Graham and you are going to do a whole media tour. We're going to do the 500 executives of CNN. And we did that last December. And it pushed our book, Chicken Soup for the Christmas Treasury, up to number one. Now, I've been friends with her for a long time. You write her little notes, you stay in touch. The ATT teaches, reach out and. And now that they bought Playboy, you can reach out and touch something worthwhile, Bob Hope said. No, 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 that's not true. <laughs> Here's that package of stuff that we paid 78 grand. We paid everybody's flight in, and we want you to have it. We want you to take it, to use it, so you can build your own dream team, because there's a team out there waiting for you to create. No, I probably can't be on it. Blockbuster attendance. Pre-sell 10 million tickets. Jillian Manis goes to the Cannes Film Festival. At Random House, the people in the... Scott, are you there? Right, come here. Come here. I was just going to brag about you. Good, 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 good. I told you I'd uh, bring you Mr. Media. This guy chases her all the way to Amsterdam, gets with her, and says, there's only one person that can do the movie, and that's me. He calls us up on the phone, and I remember we're writing dialogue for movies, and the first thing he says is, 20 years ago, I read Bob Allen's book, Nothing Done. I started flipping real estate. Then I flipped multi-apartment homes. He said, then, all of a sudden, I started flipping shopping centers. And two years ago, who talked to you and said, you've got to sell all this stuff and go do movies? Do you mind sharing that? 
I can't remember who talked to me. Oh, God. God said... God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, why don't you... This is Scott Steindorf. I don't know <laughs> Scott, by the way, Scott Steindorf is... You're about to hear one of the most amazing men. The guy, this guy is changing Hollywood faster than anyone on the planet. With that as an introduction, would you vamp and share with them a few of the things that are happening for you? Well, this is my hero right here. Mark Victor Hansen and Bob Allen. I read Bob Allen's book... 20 years ago and started buying real estate uh, using his No Money Down No Money Down and Multiple Streams of Income his new book so you guys as authors can use multiple streams of income to sell your book and so, so when you called us you said how many movies are you making concurrently were you told to make uh, I'm making 12 okay tell them some of the titles and some of the authors you got and some of the celebrities and so the okay. Well, I can't brag about myself here. Yes, yes, you can. I've just asked you to do it, Scott. I've asked you to do it. There's uh, nobody I, in Hollywood I'm, that doesn't know and love Scott. What I do is I buy the rights to best-selling books for motion pictures, and I'm starting production Monday on the Human Stain, the Philip Roth book, which stars Anthony Hopkins, Nicole Kidman, Gary Sinise, and. This summer we're doing T.C. Boyle's book, Tortilla Curtain, which we're just starting to cast. I bought the rights to Empire Falls, Richard Russo's book, which Paul Newman is starring in is, and is also my partner on. And then I'm doing Richard Hack's biography on Howard Hughes. And who's the lead in that? Which Jim Carrey's going to play Howard Hughes. <laughs> And Chris Nolan, who did Memento, is directing. And then I'm sure Jillian is here somewhere. Jillian, are you in the room yet? Not yet, okay. So I bought a book from Jillian called Jake and Mimi, which I sold to MGM, uh, which John Hertzfeldt is directing, and on and on and on, and I'm having the time of my life. And but wait, do we have fun when we go to Starbucks or wherever uh, we show up together? We, we take over the place, don't we? Yes. <laughs> so Mark is my inspiration. He is absolutely... I was at a real low point last summer, and Mark and Bob came to me right at the time that they were going to do this book, One Minute Millionaire, and got me revved up again, and, you know, five books later, I'm doing okay. Doing okay. <laughs> okay. So... Go ahead, give him a round of applause, and then I'll ask some more questions. So every one of them would like to write A, a bestseller, and B, a, best, a blockbuster bestseller, like he wants to help us fill 10 million butts and seats. And he's one of the only guys big, big enough in consciousness to buy into our waxness. But what would you recommend to them to... Uh... Story, story, story. I mean, that's... You, you know, what makes a bestseller or... You know, Hollywood buys best-selling books or really original, unique, we've never seen it before stories. And, you, you know, if you, if you look at some of the best movies, they're very, very simple stories. But they're told in a very unique fashion. And that's the key to selling a blockbuster book or selling the rights to Hollywood is telling a simple story in a unique, original way that we haven't seen before. And that's what makes a book and a movie unique. And why are that's you... simple. <laughs> so go write. I'm, I'm ready. I'm buying. I want the next bestseller here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question. Oh, over here, okay. Two questions from the audience for Scott. Anybody? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. The conflict is there a conflict between selling the book first and then writing well, the book? Well, you know, I have I have a friend of mine who is a rock and roll star, who Every Gene, one of you Gene know. Simmons of Kiss. of Kiss, and he went to the publishers and they said, "You're out of your mind. Nobody's going to buy this book." But he did Mark's philosophy, had a whole marketing plan and a goal of what he was going to do. And he went out and marketed that book like crazy. And, he, 
you know, it's been on the New York Times bestseller list, and he sold 600,000 copies. And he's second richest musician. One second. Second richest musician after Paul McCartney in the world. Because this guy sells first and then delivers. Well, um... <laughs> By the way, Gene Simmons wasn't Gene Simmons before he decided to dress and drag. Have heels that are six inches tall. Is that how high those are? But this guy is a profound businessman. Madonna, is, a, is, is Madonna a good businesswoman? Yes. I mean, she's profound. What does she do? She keeps remorphing herself. Is Oprah a good businesswoman? Why? Because she keeps reinventing herself. That's what writing is about, is reinventing yourself at levels that no one ever invented themselves before. But to answer your question... Uh, the story, you know, aside from his marketing and, you know, you have to have something that you can sell to the marketplace. And but it's called a pitch. Tell them about how the pitch works when you and I sat in Hollywood a couple of times. Well, it, a pitch is just the story. And if you're pitching publishers or movie studios, you, you know, any best-selling author, which he's one of the greatest, is out there marketing their books. There's so many great books in bookstores that just get overlooked because the authors aren't out there marketing their books. And I think there's a, there's a big difference between you, you can write the best American novel there is, and unless you're out there marketing... Is that quite, yes. question is, what's the possibility of selling a short, series of shorter stories? Well, there's a lot of anthologies and short story. You know, you know that's a new thing in publishing now. And a story, you know, a great story, whether it's two pages or 200 pages, you know, to me is, you know, marketable and sellable. Okay, there, last... There's a lot of short stories that are being so sold to Hollywood. What's the, la the last question? Why are you making all these movies? Do you want to make a difference or just make a wob of money more? I just want to be able to hang out with you. <laughs> And I knew Mark wouldn't, you know, let me socialize with him unless I sold a bunch of movies. No, but all, all my, most of my movies that I'm trying to make here are about something. You know, they all have a social theme. Uh, the Human Stain, which won the Penn Faulkner Award. You know, Philip Roth won the, no or the Pulitzer Prize for his earlier work. It's about racism. T.C. Boyle's book, Tortilla Curtain, is about the class difference. Empire Falls is about, you know, the decline of, you know, a small town in America and how we can rescue that. So I try to do material that is about something. And that attracts actors and directors and studios. And I'm also, you know, very passionate about trying to improve the human condition you know there was a theory that hollywood doesn't want you know material that's about something but that's just not true you know because we want to be inspired we movies can change the consciousness and that's what i'm trying to do give him a great round of applause thank if you would please thanks Mr. thank you All right. Do you see? But you've got to have people that are so willing to think big. And there's not, you're going to have to look around for a while to find people like Scott. But he'll be in the back so you can talk to him uh, if you want. One Millionaire Makes Movie History, and this is a Hollywood reporter. You know, that's why it was so perfect that he showed up just what he did. You can get any article and then write your own article and write it from the back because that's what you show when we sold our toy to Hasbro. That's what you show Random House. That's what you show your agent. Your book should be the lead generating device for all your other products and services. I took you through that already with Steve Covey. Always think how everyone shot it. Mega. Mega. Terry Turok, come up here as fast as you can. Terry Turok is a guy, you've seen all of his ads all over America and didn't even know you saw this guy. And he and I have just been introduced, thanks to Marshall Thurber. But he did the little Michael Jackson glove award with Pepsi. In, when the cosmonauts flew in space, they had a blow-up Pepsi. He did it. He has done things like Live Aid and stuff like that. Terry, tell them how they can promote new and unique ways and some of the stuff we've been talking about lately to have authorless tours and all that. Having a big ways. idea. Having a big idea. 
One thing I learned today in this uh, the seminar so far is be on your toes because you never know when somebody's going to hand you a mic. <laughs> that being said, one of the, the keys to following up on a big idea is making sure that when you have your moment in national spotlight, you've got three things that you're going to say in 15 seconds. And I sure wish I knew what those three things were right about now. <laughs> well, wait, tell them about uh, what you just did at the... Uh about the World Trade Center, and then you did it at the sure. main building. And um, yeah, as you know, uh, the context of the world changed entirely at, at 9-1-1, and us in the entertainment business and a lot of cause-related marketing, people started to pay attention to a lot of our causes at 9-1-1, and we said, is there opportunity in tragedy? Can we triumph over this tragedy? And uh, we started to take a look at a lot of healing processes that were happening out there, much like Chicken Soup for the Soul, and we found artwork that was uh, happening amongst kids in these schools and in, in some of the inner city schools took that artwork to some of the s schools kids that witnessed the fall of the twin towers and we took and put that on the cover of the wall street journal it's been on um oxygen oprah's network it's on cnn uh this week it was on uh prime time uh, last week on ABC Primetime. So we take a look at any time that there's a healing opportunity and any time we can bring it to light and any time we can share that story. And I know what my, I know what my three things are going to... Yeah, we're, we have it on display at the Empire State Building now. Yeah, we're going to take it on tour. He's got his shows. We, have a, we have a little uh, exhibit there at the Empire State Building. But now we are taking that Empire State Building as a, as a tribute to our fallen brothers, the Twin Towers in New York City. So we are taking it upon ourselves to help demonstrate and help charge with the entertainment industry of a prouder New York and, and to return that support that everybody has given us from other parts of the country to New York City. One other thing, what we decided to do, and Terry and I are talking, we met in Washington, D.C., we were at the Tribute to the Heroes of 911, and, and he brought all this great artwork that was done by kids, and he showed the pictures from Afghanistan, because I've been on the board of the airline that's feeding, doing all the ordnance to Afghanistan, which is 7,500 miles, 6,000 pounds per guy, and then starting Christmas Day, we sent over the food, and then Nike gave clothes for every Afghani. I mean, there's no country that's greater than ours. It gives more than ours, but Terry and I are talking, and said, look, what we got to do is postcards. We created an idea, a concept together and collectively, and that's where all the really big ideas do come from in sharing. And, and thank you, uh, Marshall and Kim. Sharing, sharing is having more, so anytime you have that opportunity. So we shared an idea, and we created this idea, this concept called Postcards for Peace. And it's simply taking a curriculum to schools and to kids and to families and having the opportunity to create a postcard. And then thanks to Dell and several other commitments, that postcard will be shrunk down. You'll get a dozen of them, two of them and will be guaranteed to be sent to anywhere in the world, places like Afghanistan. We have an air shipment going to Afghanistan. We have a troop now uh, shipment going to Bosnia. Those Bosnia kids are also creating postcards, and together we're perpetuating this message, Postcards for Peace, through artwork, children's artwork. And if you ever want to find the truth about a culture and a nature, uh, the culture of a country, look at the artwork of the children. It speaks more volumes than any words possible, so it's really remarkable. So we're bringing that artwork to light. So on a space available, Del Smith with Evergreen, who's feeding all the people and taking care of the military, we're shipping postcards from kids to kids, and we're just, we're just testing it out at little schools, but then we're going to do it both ways because we think that if kid becomes, and we got Mercy Corps with Doug Weed and Pat Boone run that thing, and they've got 170 people that will all translate these cards so they get translated. So if, if I'm a, a Taliban member and I get it, I translate it, he hates you, he wants to kill you, he thinks you're a schmuck and you're an infidel American. No, 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 we're the not going to allow that to right. the truth. Be. We're not going to let any of that happen. And, and we're just, because this guy is willing to think big and he's willing to do events like Ken Craig and Hands Across America and We Are the World. And that's the kind of stuff that, do we need to do that to sell books go like this? We want to do an authorless tour with the touring money. Do you want to talk of that? We, uh, well, sure. <laughs> when do I get to plug my book? Hey? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you have a book? Here. Yeah, my book is actually called Gravity Sucks. <laughs> it's, about, it's about nothing at all and how to accomplish it. <laughs> and it's true. Actually, looking at all these different markets, I thought, what about the market of the non-reader? There's a huge market. I'm going to go get the non-reader over there. That's a giant market. So talking about giant markets, we did have great opportunities over the past couple of years to do things like, and I'm responsible for help generating this next generation of non-readers. Thank you very much. I'm here to redeem myself, uh, creating things like the MTV Museum of Unnatural History, things like the Nintendo World Championships, 
You say, you got to be where people are. If kids were going to play Nintendo and lock themselves in the bedroom, then for God's sakes, if this is the playground of the future, let's put the spotlight on the kids. Let's talk about these kids. Let's talk about their grades. Let's not try to shut down what's happening with MTV, and let's not try to shut down what's happening with Nintendo. Let's see how we can shift that behavior, and let's see if we can turn that into an opportunity, because those things are never going to stop. So we need to be able to shift that behavior a bit. What was your question, Mark? You can see why I love him. He's unwrapped. I mean, the guy's totally unzipped, but isn't he fun? Gravity sucks. We're so looking. buy my book. Oh, it's going out on tour with Mark's book. Thank you. Your question was about your tour. You some little book you're writing. I don't know. But anyway, how to make millions or something like that. Uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, there's a wonderful opportunity on One Minute Millionaire, and we have a fantastic, uh, in the spirit of big ideas, and some of the big ideas that we've done with QVC. Thank you for bringing up QVC earlier. Um, I know you told the story probably about... Selling the Brooklyn Bridge last night? Uh, just, yeah, I touched that. Yeah, he, of course he told the story, right? He was like, uh, I did not know that the Brooklyn Bridge had been sold, but a good idea can be done twice. I sold the Brooklyn Bridge again on QVC. <laughs> I really lowered the bar in big ideas here and uh, did sell it on QVC along with Muhammad Ali's house and the Hollywood sign we offered for sale on, on uh, QVC as well. Raised lots of money for that, that fund. Uh, but your book... We're going to talk about your book here. So you notice how I parlay the opportunity that you asked the question and get all the information in. Uh, you, we, someday, by the way, if, if we had a chance, you've got to see his video because he does the best, most sublime, out-of-the-box video because the guy thinks out-of-the-box totally. Anyway, in all fairness to, to your book, and, and it's going to be a fantastic tour, but the opportunity to move a million dollars across the country and the steps that it takes to get to those million dollars is something we're going to demonstrate in an actual tour. And then to actually look at that, that million dollars and the big question you, we all have to ask ourselves is money the ultimate motivator and I think there's an opportunity to take a look at that as well so we're going to take a tour we're going to take a million dollars on tour with the Brinks truck and we're going to have the steps that it takes to reach that million dollars and then what does that million dollars mean to you and then maybe even put a mirror at the end and maybe an opportunity to move that money to push that money to be in control of that money so that money's not in control of you cool give him a round of applause thanks Jerry thank you thank you thank you, thank you. One more person I want to introduce just real quick, and then I've got to summarize, and we're tying it up. Now we get to go to lunch. Reed, would you come up here quickly? Uh, I have done a lot of grow rich in different niches. One of the niches I've spent a lot of my life in is the network marketing niche. I met this guy early on because he worked with the world's greatest economists, as far as I'm concerned. There's only two billionaire economists. My favorite is Paul Zane Pilzer because he's a make a difference guy, wrote Unlimited Wealth. You ran his little company, and then uh, do you want to tell him just one sentence about Paul, and then we'll go on to Video Plus. Sure. Paul and I actually have been friends and business partners for a little over 12 years. I was actually his banker years ago. And it's really been a pleasure to work with him because he's had a message of economics, really paradigm shifting about where wealth is going to be coming in the next 10, 20 years. And where is it coming? Um, originally in 1990, it was all coming in the distribution of products. Now, in the next 10 to 20 years, it's actually going to be the distribution of intellectual products. Intellectual Point at your temples go, hmm, that's interesting. And we've been able to leverage that in a couple of unique marketing places. Go ahead. Right. We've been able to leverage that in a couple of unique marketing places, and he ironically found a home that you and I actually found each other in, which is indirect selling and network marketing, uh, which is really an industry which uh, today is about uh, $15 billion uh, in sales in the U.S. A little over 15 million people are actually active in this business, and they're actually the forefront of change. And many companies used to use direct selling and network marketing to introduce products out to test them for two or three years. These days, authors and talent are finding a wonderful opportunity to introduce new, fresh concepts to an industry that is out really changing the lives of Americans because they're empowering them on an individual basis to be able to get financially free or really to be able to ultimately go spend time with their family. So he's head of a little company called? Video Plus. Video Plus, and he and another guy figure out how to do this. Their little company is only a few years old. They've got 35 employees. Can yeah. I tell them how much you guys do a year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 30, Go ahead. 30, 35 years, we've had consistent uh, revenue increase and uh, with the industry and following with, you know, out of the $15 billion in sales, you know, we're happy to be able to take, you know, 1% or 2% of that. These guys are doing phenomenally. Some of you are going to have to figure that out when you get home, but it's serious money. <laughs> but what, what happens is that one little book was made, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, not long ago by Bob Kiyosaki because it just went through the whole market. But that's, these guys make a tape. They've just finished a tape with me called? 
So, what's your story? So, what's your story? It's one of the most galvanizing tape I've ever done. We think we'll get how many out? 20 million copies to all these people. And the other ones that have sold pretty well are, tell them about the doctor. We've, uh, there's a couple of tapes out there that have really hit the target. One of them is called Dead Doctors Don't Lie, which has sold over 25 million copies of the tape. Many of you have probably actually gotten one in one of your years from some network marketing company. Uh, Paul Pilzer's tape called Economic Paradigms moved a little over 9 million tapes in a couple of years in the 90s. And then now, and the now we've just helped them craft a new message uh, in the wellness industry that has actually moved a million units in less than 12 months. If anybody uh, would like me to mail a free copy of Mark's tape that we're going to be releasing in the next month or so, please uh, give me your card or something during the event. I'll make sure that I drop in the mail and you can get an example of how to take a message as broad as Mark's of being able to tell stories and empower people, condense it down to 20 minutes, and in essence, it's a 20-minute advertorial for Mark. And we're going to be getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these out and helping uh, to promote the One million, one uh, Minute Millionaire. Good. Give Reed a great round of applause. Thanks, my friend. This concludes this session.